athlete. So believe it or not, this is actually a fact. No one has think... ever walked out of any interview I've ever done. No one's ever, as far as I know, regretted it. But it's because I'm very careful on how I set it up mm. first. I feel like that whole spiel you just said is very relatable to also dating. But you, just, when you're asking someone else out on a date, it's just like give them a nice way to reject. You don't want to you. put too much pressure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, really good. It's really good. Yeah. <laughs> Love cups. Are you learning something? I'm learning. Mm. <laughs> See, local. Like what you don't do, mate, is you don't just say like, "Hey, um, are you free like any day this week?" And then they're like, "Oh, I'm not free on Wednesday." But what about Thursday, Friday? I'm, I'm Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then like as soon as you say that, like the person's just like, "This guy's a fucking loser. He's got nothing going on." Like it's how you say things. Like, well, no, just, I just usually ask funny. like, "Yo, I'm hanging out with my friends on Thursday. You should come by." And then. Like you should come hang with us, like as a group, because I think like taking a girl on a one-on-one -on -one first date is actually like a lot of pressure. It's You're one of the big. Right, get that soy milk gas out again and start drinking. <laughs> you absolute wreck of a human being. Go Wait. on, Thomas. Right, this is going to be episode forty-nine of Listen Local. Wow. And I'm just going to be straight up with people because we keep it very transparent on the show. You know, we don't build up some fake hype narrative. You know. When there's no League of Legends to talk about, what's the point in talking about League of Legends? So I told local what we do is when it's the off season or it's the downtime between leagues, we're getting people to talk about other things than just League of Legends. So mm -hmm. we will in some sense touch on it, obviously. And obviously any moderator watching this video right now, we talk about League of Legends at least 60% of this video. So whatever you th say, you could never <laughs> justify removing this video from the subreddit. I don't know why I'm addressing you directly. It's actually giving you everything you wanted. And quite frankly, it's a bad precedent to set. But anyway, just thought I'd put that out there. Sort of a bit of programming before they watch the episode. So our guest for this one, Loco. Mm -hmm. And don't worry, Loco. I'm just going to give everyone, you know what? Before we start, since people might think this is going to get too abstract and not be about League, I'll just say this. Stick around till the end of the episode, right? Because towards the end of the episode, I am going to briefly talk about League of Legends when I straight dry roast Loco for that absolutely pathetic video he made to honor his bet that he wow. was. One of the most pathetic videos I've ever oh seen. My we'll God. get into that at the end, though, because okay. <laughs> this motherfucker needs to be taken down for that behavior because that was outrageous. But anyway, we'll leave that. We'll, we'll, we'll save that. We'll save that. I'm so excited. That. We'll save that. <laughs> Flame will come at the end. There's, after you eat your meal, you have to eat your vegetables and your potato and the meat. At the end, you get the dessert. You don't get it at the beginning of the show. I know that as a child. If you give them the dessert immediately, they'll never eat the other shit. Like, it's too late at that point. So anyway, we tricked them all our local. They have to watch until the end to get some prime foreign flaming local about double lift now if that isn't our entire venn diagram and people watch this show i don't know what it is so i've set this one up well so our guest for this one local is i actually don't know how you say your surname how do you say it duan it's duan yes uh okay. you're not the only one to mess that up or mm. not know <laughs> indeed so lisa duan is someone yeah. who you've worked with a whole bunch of company i remember i first saw you when you were with like the score i think it was right yeah, yeah, that was Who actually the that? first esports company, 2015 to 2018, actually. Mm. So it's been some time, but yeah, that was the first time I actually ventured into esports. Okay. Yeah. And what is your situation in terms of like, how do you pick the games that you work with, or how, how in terms of the companies you work with, do they pick which games to cover? I mean, when I started at the score, I just graduated university and I was kind of just looking for any job. You know, when you come out of journalism school, you're kind of like, I'm just going to do any job I can do. Um, but luckily, the people I actually roomed with for university, they were all gamers. So the last okay. four years of university, they played Dota, Starcraft, League, Hearthstone were kind of the big ones. So I was really exposed to it. So when I saw the score was hiring for their esports uh, division, which they just opened up, I'm like, you know what, let's just do it. Why not? Got the job. And so when they started doing esports, they were kind of trying to hit the top games at the moment, which was primarily League. Um, so that's what we started with. And that's what I did for the first three years of my esports career, just covering League of Legends, going to events, meeting people like Loco, uh, interviewing, doing a lot of well, There's downsides as well. Yeah, I understand. Wow. Yeah. You know, meeting Loco. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Meeting Thorin. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, the last three years, I've mainly focused on League. I did a little bit of Dota interviews as well, dabbled a little bit, and now I'm working for Northern Arena, who also does esports content. And we're kind of sure. doing a bit of everything too. So it's kind of been a crazy journey, but I started in League, so this is still a League show. Okay. <laughs> That it is. That's true. Yeah. When you actually met Loco, what event did you meet him at? You know, I was actually thinking about it today. I was like, where did we meet? I think we met at Vegas 
TL after party. I'm pretty sure we met there. And remember, you wear pantsuits, and I. Gave oh you... my god! Yeah. Oh my... yeah Why yeah. don't you tell the story? So the source, the beginning of our friendship was literally local flaming me the entire night. I think it was after. Well, obviously, right. uh, LA and uh, NALCS finals. We were in Las Vegas. Team Liquid hosted a party, and local being you know the drunkard he is was making fun of me the whole time for wearing a pantsuit, which I don't know what the big deal was. And that was the start of our lovely friendship. I did not make fun of you <laughs> that much. What's wrong with wearing um, a pantsuit like? Yeah. It was it yeah. was very um very pantsuity at like a party where no one else was wearing anything like What's that. A, listen, local, it was very I fashion I really, forward. I don't really appreciate you fashion shaming people. Right. You know, like she's trying to wear like a very conservative but utilitarian outfit, you know. <laughs> what you like some pervert, you're like, show more skin or something. What's wrong with you, local? You know how hard it is for women in this industry already right? you like you. People yeah, like people me? Like shaming. Oh my god. <laughs> I've done nothing but support the women in this industry. Well, I mean, we're all about that, but enough of that, local. So, anyway, that's half your problem, man. That's both your blessing and your curse, isn't wow. it? Like, <laughs> oh, just saying. So, anyway, here's the... No, the thing I don't understand about that is, like... Wait, what's wrong with wearing a pantsuit? Right, Loco? <laughs> you know what it is? Maybe... Hillary Clinton wears pantsuits all the time. She was almost your president. But you were standing oh with her, Oh, my God. Loco. What's your deal? I, I, Korea had a female president, and she wore pantsuits the whole time. But she, hers was, like, very billowy at yeah, the bottom. Yeah, but the difference between her law court and Hillary Clinton is she was a really corrupt individual who provably committed a lot of crimes and should absolutely have been tried by the court system. Mm. Unlike, you get the joke first. You see where I'm doing that. Anyway, mm. continue on. We'll let that go. Uh, we'll okay, I will touch on it very briefly. But it was Come on. vertical stripes with a flared bottom. So it was not a very, like, flattering silhouette for Lisa. And I've never even thought these things. What? I, like, listen, I know that that's like the sort of thing they say in like cosmopolitan articles. Look, about. how the fuck do you know that? <laughs> how do you know that? Yeah. Like, make you look what what makes Loco the expert on fashion all of a sudden wearing well, your know. Dua Lipa fangirl shirt? Like, what is. <laughs> yeah, Loco. How old are you now? Then? Like 27 or something? How old are you? I'm uh, 22. 22. He's like 27 or 28 at least, right? He, he's that old. He talks shit on me saying I'm old, right? But I, I, here's the thing. I embrace my age. I'm 22. I just, I'm I, 22. Even, I even have the philosophy personally that I don't even think I get older. I just get better because I get more experience in life, you know, like I know what I'm doing. Loco tries to go with this whole angle of like, haha, you are old. It's like, mate, you're still dressing like you're 19 and you are definitely about 10 years older than that. So I don't know where you're getting off at this point in time. Oh my god. Is this what this show is going to be like? It's just Lisa <laughs> Dorn blaming me? Oh. That wasn't me. That, exactly. I was, you know? Yeah. You know? <laughs> oh man, that's good. But yeah, no, honestly, I think it was just Loco being nervous, not knowing how to start conversation. Wow. So, you know what? Cool. Ultimately, it worked. Yeah. You know, like, it's fine. <laughs> oh. it's uh, <laughs> I will not stand for this. Your pantsuit wasn't good. We're going to dig up picture. Sitting. We're going to dig no, up picture. what the hell? It was super fashionable, and I'm not going to... You know what it is? It's a difference between Toronto and, I think, LA vibes. You right. know? I think local grew up West Coast. Girls are very, like, casual. I'm from a city where, you know, we can dress up, and it's normal. Like, it's not a big deal. So I think Loco was just taken back. I think it's, it's okay. colder. You know, there's a lot of reasons yeah, to have that functional okay. clothing. <laughs> Flared bottom exactly. vertical stripe pantsuit was not happening. Not everyone's out there at fucking Venice Beach, like you know, <laughs> with all has got like booty shorts on and shit. What are you fucking talking about? Like, she's in a party. Seems reasonable right? to me. Oh yeah, my exactly. god. Wait, Thorne, where are you from? I am from the northeast of the United Kingdom. Oh, okay. Okay. So we're not very, you know, it's not really warm. I'm used to things being, put, put it this way, my original look was I used to have a big coat on, right? Yeah, all people think I was oh, doing right. that. Yeah, people used to literally tell me stuff like, that's genius. Like, I used to get American people like, oh, the bloody genius, the branding. It's like, it's not branding, mate, it's just cold in the room, right? It's totally logical as to why I'm wearing that. Like, I didn't sit around and go, hmm, what sort of, like, unique look could I design? And no, it was just cold. I was wearing a coat and a scarf, like, it was just cold. It's not cold anymore. I've got money now. I moved away from Yeah. Exactly. Congrats. Yeah. Congrats. Exactly. Still bare no bones in the back, but it's okay. <laughs> you know what I can. Gradually build it. Like, for example, I am just some shade of blue. Because for the problem is the light that I actually have that makes it look good is like, I don't want that shit in my eyes for three hours. So I only use that for my own videos. For shit I did with Loco, I just phone it in, you know, I just turn on like a shit webcam mic. I let all the quality go bad. I go, whatever, it's not on my channel, so I don't have any quality control no. issues there. Dorian's definitely been upgrading and moving up in the world. He used to do shows with Monty. Now he's doing it with one of the best co-hosts in the industry. Like he's definitely done a great job for himself. Can we just leave silence there? <laughs> That's usually, no, that, you, you figured it all out. You're, you're fast <laughs> 
what you do is when Loco makes a joke, there's only two appropriate responses. If it's like a terrible joke, you just tell him it's shit. If it's if it's like just average, but you don't want to like you don't want to give it too much praise because then he'll start yeah. thinking he did something good. You just let it yeah. die. You just go. Anyways, how are you doing? So um how are things going? <laughs> you just leave him on his own. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you drinking Soylent right now? Yeah, why not? You're like a fucking meme of a human, aren't you? So you live in LA. You literally, like, you look like a fucking clothes horse. There's no flesh <laughs> to you whatsoever. And you're drink you're eating a meal replacement. Mate, you need to replace all of your meals with actual food. Have you ever thought of, like, a fucking steak with some potatoes, some broccoli? Eat that three times a day. Do 15 pull-ups after each one and then you actually might look like some sort of adult human being what's going on what's wrong with soylent it's convenient are you sponsored by soylent no <laughs> sadly he's not even that would at least be a cool reason to have it wouldn't it? i know what you mean like if he was that'd be pretty cool but he's just drinking it now because he actually unironically thinks that that's just reasonable to just be drinking like food Dude, food the speaking of soylent sponsorship <laughs> Like, whoever's, like, the charge of marketing for Soylent, mm. like, they were giving out trial, like, sponsorships or, like, trial versions for people to try out to, like, just random girls on Twitter. I'm talking about random girls on Twitter with, like, thousand or less followers and, like, 10 or 20 viewers on Twitch, and they would get, like, these packages of Soylent and then to try out. Are you ready out. for where this is going? You can already see where this is going, right? It's going to go to, like, well, where's my sponsorship? I've got, like, <laughs> at least... I reached, followers. I reached out to them at, about a sponsorship and they're like, oh, we're currently not looking for a sponsorship right now. And while my timeline is spanned by girls, like just like drinking Soylent. Oh, thank you so much for like letting me try. I'm like, I've been drinking Soylent for such a long time and I have a platform. Why don't I get a Soylent sponsorship? Oh, no, you went the wrong way, Loco. You're, Loco doesn't understand the industry. This is how you should have spun it, Loco. You should have said, I see on Twitter that you're sponsoring a lot of young women in the esports industry with, on their social media. Well, I actually spend a lot of my time hanging out with young women on social media. <laughs> Therefore, I could, you know, make, let's put the two together. Give me the Soylent. I'll hand the Soylent to them as I take my selfie for Instagram. Mm hmm. I'll do that. You got to yeah, I'll you got to go time. you got to go the path of least resistance local. You got to mm. use what they're trying to do against them. Mm. Let's get to the actual meat and potatoes of the show. Let's talk about Something you don't know about. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about yeah, Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the only way it would be the meat and potatoes, isn't it, Loco? Just metaphorically, obviously. Let's talk about <laughs> eSport media and <laughs> kind of yeah, what's going on in eSport media. That's your intro? That's what you start with? <laughs> All right, I'm, not, I'm usually not the host. Don't worry. Why don't you go ahead? Why this don't is you... the first time right. I'm like on this side, so I'm like I actually get to relax yeah. and just like answer it's questions. Like, but you freaking started the conversation like that. I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, no, sorry. You know, sometimes, I'm sorry. Sometimes when you do an interview, you know, you want to throw like a very general question so the person has a lot of space. He didn't even give you any area. He was just oh, like, I know the oh, media. You know, the I... entire field of esports. What do you think about that? Okay, then? okay. I know the perfect. How are you feeling, Lisa? Let's start there. Ooh, <laughs> spicy. Uh, All right. I, I appreciate that question. However, I would like more context and I hope that it's personalized to me. That would make me feel more comfortable that you actually did your research. Okay. How do you feel about doing shows with? content creators that are much more bigger and successful and better looking oh. than yourself so with thorin um you know what he the fact that i got to do a show with him was really exciting whereas loco being a part of it i thought that was a nice add-on but it's kind of like that bonus prize that you don't really care about <laughs> exactly um, but I mean, if you wanted to hang around and watch solo so, loco drink soylent you could at least do it off camera where he'd be less annoying he'd actually be an authentic person there wouldn't he so <laughs> In real life, he's not bad. He's actually all right in real life. You know, I don't know why. On camera, guys, something gets lost in translation. This guy appears. We're all doing our best. We're trying. It's this is like, sort of like a. It's like the 49th episode of an intervention where I'm just trying to like. I'm like Morpheus trying to get this motherfucker out of the matrix of being just a mad soy actually, boy. I'm curious. Over there. So, Thurin, you've been doing the show with Loco for a while now. Have you seen yes. his kind of growth since episode one as a host? I actually have. I have seen some. Like, here's the thing. He spent at least the first three or four episodes genuinely thinking that, like, he was being attacked personally every time we played him. <laughs> you were Whereas attacking like, me personally. Yeah, in a way. Like, here's the thing. I, I wouldn't really go that hard at people. Like, so, so, like, it definitely was just in fun. So he definitely learned some of that over time. Another thing he did that was really annoying early on, if, you, if you're someone who's obviously hosted podcasts and stuff and interviews, you'll appreciate this, is he used to literally get mad at me when like he'd have written like a big list of topics and I could tell from the first five topics, like, oh, they're not going to be interested in that actually. Like from what they've said, like, let's just skip this next part. And he would be going like, why don't we go back to that part on the topic list? And I was like, 
They don't want to fucking... Did you not hear the way he answered the <laughs> first question? He's not, yeah, he's not going to answer the sixth question there, Loki. He wasn't even told... He, there, was, there was some teething problems early, but luckily... I mean, I'm not going to lie and say, like, I brought him along slowly. I just straight up told him, like, shut the fuck up. You don't know anything about this local. I've done this my whole life. You're, you're a fucking tourist here. Just stay in your way. So I, I, you know, I was a bit of a harsh parent. I won't lie. But I think he responded well to that. You know, That's good. That. You know, it's funny because just Loco, like, I've interviewed him a couple times. So on the other end of the mic, he's very good at giving a good interview. You know, like, he gives you the perfect mix of, of, like, analyze, good quality content, but, like, a little spice. So, like, you get a good quote out of him. So he's really good at that. But I don't know what he's like as an actual host. But as I can tell from the beginning of this, uh, there's still some room. I'm just... I'm usually much better. I'm just very nervous around you. <laughs> oh, exactly. Just like the yeah, time we yeah. met. That's yeah. fair. That's fair. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm just starstruck. <gasps> no, okay, but to actually answer your question, going back to it, it's <clears throat> awesome. I feel, I was actually quite. I don't want to say honored because, you know, I was just like, it's cool to be part of the content creators. And obviously you guys have been doing this for a really long time. And so I've seen your stuff for a very long time. So to actually share this and like talk about issues that are relevant to all of us, I was like, that's really exciting. I'm kind of nervous too, because I've never been on this end. Um, so it's a little awkward for me, but I think I'm just gonna treat it like, you know, we're hanging out, we're friends. Mm-hmm. If we were drinking, like we just talk about issues that are relevant to us. So mm-hmm. I'm actually looking forward to this a lot. <clears throat> I mean, listen, just because Loco was here as well, it is presumptuous to think that when you come on a show, like, we're all friends. Like, me and Loco, that was, that's still a way of the way, yeah. We're acquaintances mm-hmm. at the moment. Maybe in future he can earn his way into that. Like, very special. <laughs> so, obviously, you seem cool, so it's fine with you. I don't know about that. <laughs> we, we've got a very instant rapport, I felt like. But I don't know. I'm still, I, I have to, like, the problem is Loco's betrayed me a couple of times in the past. So, Ooh. that's still, I've still got a few of those knives in my back. Some of those wounds haven't fully healed up. So, I, I have to sort of test him a bit, you when? know. When was this? Well, when did you betray quite, him? Quite publicly, I'm afraid. So what happened was, in the early days of League of Legends, I had a big podcast. It was called Summoning Insight with Monte Cristo, right? Yeah. And we had Loco on the show a number of times. He was actually one of the most popular guests. And just he- because... Well, what happened was, because Monty criticized the fact that TSM hired Loco as their coach, Loco took this very, very personally, right? And even though, in hindsight, I think even he would admit, there was it, Monty's criticism wasn't totally unfounded. Like, mm-hmm. it was stuff like, you know, he was a very young guy, he hadn't, didn't have a history as a coach, you know, he'd just become as a player, and obviously as a player, he was a very spicy individual, let's just say, you know, not exactly perfect coaching material. And the problem was, back then, Loco was one of those guys who it's like, first of all, whether it's true or not, he just couldn't handle it if people like talked shit to him. Like he took it very personally. So hence double lift, Monty, other people he had <laughs> wars with, you know. And then also, I don't I can see where he's coming from. In that era of having coaches, a lot of it was just about game knowledge. So actually, if you had game knowledge, you could be a coach. So to him, he was like, This is like unfair, they're just targeting me. So bizarrely, Loco apparently comes from the like, I don't know. 90s rap school of logic where when you have beef you have to like ride with your homies or whatever because i wasn't even involved in this story so far you noticed but so all of a sudden he's not just flaming monty on twitter he's trying to come at me and if you know anything about that by the way don't ever come at me because i'm already bad enough when people don't come at me when you come at me that's like I've, I've, I've given the example before. That's like when someone lures themselves into the lion pit at the zoo. If the lion then mauls them, you can't blame the lion, can you? That is, that is what lions do. Like, stay out of that fucking lion pit if you don't want to get mauled. So, Loco tried coming at me. He literally, like, uh, some of the stuff this motherfucker did. Anyway, I, I was Loco winning for a bit. I was winning for a bit. When TSM won finals, I was winning. Well, I was winning. Loco, actually, this ties into actually when I'm going to flame you later for that video. Because I will say. <laughs> One of the things we did was we made a bet, right? He said if he, if TSM, who he was going to coach, mm. if they won the LCS, then he wanted us to call him Lord Loco for like a year. But the key thing was, because if any other team won, he had to call us Lord. That's like a great bet for us, you know, if anyone else wins a league. And in fact, it was actually a very close season. Like even in the playoffs, we very close matches. So here's the thing, though. When Loco won, I won 100% on a this bet. In fact, for an entire year... Every time we reference that, I called him Lord Loco. So I actually showed you how, like, an honorable man mm-hmm. honors a bet that he did. Loco, as we'll talk about later, when he honors a bet, he's the motherfucker who just, like, phones it in completely and does the absolute bare minimum and doesn't put any effort in whatsoever. And then he just sort of begrudgingly throws you over whatever he owes you. It's like, what is even that shit? Like, have some fucking sense. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> we'll keep, that that later. Later. Keep, keep okay. that till later. Keep that till later. Let me let me go into a topic that's actually really important about esports <laughs> media and media in general. Recently, Russell Westbrook and along with Russell Westbrook, Paul George have been very, very negative towards the media where they don't answer questions. And it was specific people, but yeah, it's to 
Oklahoma, what is it? Oklahoma City media. Like these are yes. media people that would be supporting the Oklahoma City Thunder. So it's been such a big problem where Steve Kerr, um, the head coach of Golden State Warriors, one of the most popular and the most successful teams right now, he's someone very respected and very well liked by players. Actually spoke up and he's like, this kind of thing cannot fly. The whole reason NBA is so popular is because of the kind of close relationship that the players can develop sure. with the fans due to how available they are. And the league is in a really good place right now. And this kind of stuff is really dangerous and it's a slippery slope. So the two instances where it kind of applies to League of Legends is Team Liquid with their CSGO team in the very last, not the very last, but a recent tournament they played. It was a major. After they got knocked out by... Why don't you explain that part and I'll explain the TSM part. Yeah, basically the very short version is Team Liquid was actually like, it, at the time, pe people thought they had a chance to win the major and they were like the number two seed in most people's mind. And so they were on the opposite side of the bracket to the only team that everyone thought could beat them, Astralis. So everyone was waiting for them to meet in the final. But actually the team they were playing in the quarterfinals was actually like ranked like 13th or something. So they were like a big favorite to beat them. It was this team called Ents, who now is very good actually mm. in Finland. But they, because they shockingly got beaten, basically in the match that in their minds was like, oh, well, we're definitely going to win that one. And then, yeah, we'll probably win the semifinal. And then like, they were sort of thinking ahead in the tournament. So because they got shocked so early and they had such high expectations, they just canceled all their media obligations, basically, and said, like, we won't do any interviews. The obvious reason being, like, they'd been massively upset. So they obviously they thought to themselves, like, we're just going to look like idiots or we're just going to, like, who wants to get asked questions when we've been knocked out? But the problem with this, as, as with, to tie it back in, is obviously... Even if you lose like that, people still want to hear from your players. And, mm -hmm. and obviously for the team, people want to know what's going on with the team. And in, in light of what Loco is alluding to here, as a sportsman, just in the modern day, that is that does come with the territory. Like win or lose, someone has to represent the team. Someone mm -hmm. has to give like a media front face. Someone has to keep the narratives going because it is more than just the game and the server. Like that's not what the sell makes your salary. That's not what makes everyone buy. It's all the other aspects as well. The narratives, like the interesting elements, things like actually sometimes you do want to know what someone feels about a game not every time I admit, that's a very difficult topic but sometimes you do so what were you going to go with this local what and then in combination tsm is also very very selective about interviews and they always have been so recently at lcs um they've only been giving interviews to the three biggest outlet it's been inben espn and travis gafford and that excludes me so i've only gotten one tsm interview throughout last split um one with tony they just Certain teams and certain parts of esports and sports being selective with media, it's, I think, a huge problem um, for the scene overall and for the growth of the scene overall. Yeah, 100%. I agree. Um, at my time at the score, even then, I remember there were certain teams that were really, really difficult to reach. TSM being one, Cloud9 for some reason also being one. Um, and that made it really hard because, one, they were the biggest teams in NA, right? So not being able to talk to them made it so difficult for us to reach a wider audience and honestly kind of put it really turns like the media off in a sense and the media are the people who are delivering the players and their stories to the people right so when teams do that they are giving a really negative impression of their own team but the thing is i feel like they feel like it's okay because now with every esports team they have their own content team right mm -hmm. so they want to control what is being said they don't want to put that in the hands of a third person party like media who may ask a question that caught like catches someone off guard and then they say something dumb and we see this happen all the time totally understand but it's almost like a distrust with media and i don't know if that's a thing that's just because esports is so young whereas with traditional sports there is that kind of standard how to do interviews when someone loses so journalists are kind of more respectful whereas maybe in esports since they're the journalists in it are kind of younger they don't know how to do that line carefully and be sensitive and therefore it just creates like this loop of distrust and then it just it keeps going so i agree with you that this is a really big issue but is it something that we actually can command or control as media probably not unfortunately especially with teams doing their own like documentary series they release their own content the audience is happy so they're not really demanding on behalf of the media that you know that we should be able to speak to them so there is really nothing in a sense that the media can do i don't know if you guys have any ideas 
in regards to that, yeah. I mean, Loco, mm-hmm. in a way, actually answered that himself, if you think about it, because he didn't say TSM does no interviews and they only do our reality show. He said they do it with the three big outlets, which and then he listed off at ESPN. So, like, so as long as you are a big outlet, they acknowledge that they need some media outlets, etc. Mm-hmm. The problem is, and I would say this is a big issue in esports journalism entirely right now, is you don't have many big outlets. Like there are a lot of people who are trying to do it, who are hustling, who were on a much lower level. Like locals in a bizarre scenario, because on the one hand, he's sort of starting out as an interviewer, but he does have obviously a way bigger profile than the other people. So he's sort of caught in between the two spots because I could speak a little bit on this myself because I literally was on both sides of this equation. So a few years ago, in line with actually the exact time we were talking about when local was the coach at TSM, I was actually blacklisted by TSM. Like they literally <laughs> said behind the scenes, like nobody is allowed to do interviews with foreign basically. This is local's and fault. So- you can tell that's a guilty laugh right there no it's not it's not it's not it me totally is. it's not really but it's just it's just he was you know he was part of a gang back then he thought they were cool so whatever it's all right i've got, he's in my gang now so it's not like he can fucking talk shit is it so anyway right the thing about that is though i actually don't entirely disagree with what reginald did at the time blacklist to me in as much as like at the time i think my social media would have been literally 10 times less like my profile okay in the esports hardcore world people would know who i was but even in the wider esports world yeah, some of the people wouldn't know you like back then individual names weren't brands like mm-hmm. i was part of whatever like so for example i worked with the site called on gamers at the time which was part which was owned by cbsi at the top so big american tv network slash digital media company so my own brand is connected to a bigger brand there mm-hmm. so the difference is at the time if he like blacklists us we're the ones who lose out but what changed actually over time and the reason why then i was able to get like tsm people including reginald to do stuff years later is when i built my own individual brand and actually this is something reginald and lena even basically admitted to me is because i did so much stuff aside from my interviews that were like my own videos and thoughts Mm -hmm. and articles and stuff well, obviously, when if you get your brand big enough, that itself has an influence on the community and mm-hmm. has an impact. Like if you put out a video, for example, criticizing TSM, there's going to be a certain like cross section of the, of the public who might agree with that or might just take your points on board and say, hey, I never thought about that. Yeah, actually, I didn't like the way they did that. So what actually TSM and Reginald in this case figured out was, in my particular instance, the reason it actually would now benefit them to work with me is because that way they got to have some kind of a, a voice on my platform. Mm-hmm. So now the people who are only watching my videos don't only hear my opinion. They get to hear what Reginald thinks. And in fact, if I ask Reginald a tough question, he could give an answer that maybe he gives a great answer that they listen to. So the downside with that is not everyone could do that. It's going to be very, very tough to get yourself to that kind of profile. So I, I agree. I think it's a tough one because on the one hand, I know what it's like with like certain journalists. Like I, I'm not exactly sure about the case you're talking about, Loco. Mm-hmm. Like I do know that actually Russell Westbrook famously with a lot of media has been like very, very sort of like snippy when he loses like he has kind of a bit of a bad attitude so mm-hmm. i could believe maybe he's being unfair on that there obviously are some media that can be annoying like they just ask really negative questions or they fish for like they're trying to get you to say something that bad about your teammates all the time i can get if you like get biased against those people the problem is if you cut yourself off against most media you are going to miss out on what could be a lot of really great interviews or general interviews that your fans want to see yeah, I mean, the problem with Russell Westbrook is it's not just towards this one guy. Um, a lot of interviewers came up and were talking about it. They're like, oh, when he had his shoe deal, I was asked to get flown out by my company to talk to him. So I got flown out. I stayed at a hotel. And then when I did get to talk to him, he gave me pretty much no answers. And I was very shocked. And if I was a younger interviewer, I actually would have cried. But I know because it was Russell Westbrook and he does this kind of shit all the time. Like it was just part of like interviewing Russell Westbrook. Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> So, wait a minute. Why were they going to cry? This is an adult <laughs> human being, right? Why if they... What world are we living in? Like, now I'm already worried. Because I was... You know what? Right up until, right up until that point, I was on this guy's side. Whoever Sorry, was maybe he was a figure of speech. Okay, no, relax. No, I, I think relax. they were serious. I think we live in a world now where this person was about to go like, oh, they won't talk to me. Such so crying and like... Oh, I, like Unless you're seven years old, come on. On this note, I'm actually curious. What would What was your like hardest interview to do? Like whether it was with player or a team, like what was the hardest interview you had to do? Hardest to get or hardest to actually to interview? To do, like a player that was really difficult mm-hmm. or someone was like really emotional. Because I can think of some moments where even I had a hard time. Like in my head, I'm like, frick, you're like, why are they acting this way? But I had to just kind of push through it. Mm-hmm. And then afterwards in my head, I'm like, okay, I'm never interviewing that person again. Because that was like the worst 
experience. You're you know? allowed to swear on this show, by the way. I wasn't sure. I was like, okay. uh. <laughs> I was like, frick. Okay, yeah, so okay. fuck. I was like, I didn't know what to do. But now in my head, every time I think of that player, I'm like, okay, I'm going to avoid that person. You know, like, mm. did you guys have a person like that? So. Mm, oh, actually, you guys are wait. hesitating? Um, I actually stay away from doing too difficult of an interview. So like there are players I have a lot of drama with, like most notably double lift. So I never asked for a double lift interview. And it Wait be... a minute, wait a minute. I'm gonna have to call you out on this <laughs> one. one. Like we'll call. It's possible you're telling the truth right now. But let's be real. If you asked for a double lift interview, he's not saying yes. Yeah, I mean, he's not saying yes, <laughs> so but- There'd be no point, there'd be no not, point even asking. Yeah, he's right? not saying yes, but I also won't ask because I know it'll be so awkward. So there's times where Double if will walk into the room for media to do an interview with someone else and the entire room becomes so tense and like no one's speaking. Like people are speaking and then double if walks in because everyone knows about the drama between me and double and the room just becomes like so fucking tense. Like so immature, so awkward. Do you guys think like this drama is like bullshit or made up? Like we literally were both invited to the same birthday party and I chose not to go. And I also heard from a friend he ch heard, chose not to go because both of us heard the other person was invited. Right. Like, wait this a is, second. This wait is, a minute. Like, you're doing drama. that thing again. You're doing that thing again like that guy in the interview did where you're just saying stuff that we're supposed to accept as reasonable. And then you continue into the <laughs> next part when you, you said it's completely unreasonable. So basically, let me just summarize. Mm -hmm. You were both invited to a birthday party. Mm -hmm. Now, when someone invites someone to their birthday party, mm -hmm. they are sending a message that says i'm celebrating a very important occasion for myself that happens once mm -hmm. a year and i would really like these friends and family to be with me to share this experience <clears throat> so you both independently didn't go to the birthday party <laughs> of the person who very politely invited you mm -hmm. just over some stupid ass beef over being fucking league of legends video game players about half a decade ago you both think this is reasonable you're both assholes what are you talking about <laughs> get your fucking shit together at least coordinate and what do you not go it's you know like, both just assholes it's like divorced parents you know like can't you guys just re like act okay for the child like can't you put that you know face on yeah. I, I don't know no? I, i'm not sure but anyways so i try not to ask for players that i think will be so the interview would be really bad just due to drama or due to the situation but the probably the hardest interview i've done is the one with darshan where this was when clg was like in the gutters and i'm doing an interview with darshan and i had a choice to either make the interview very nice or actually ask him rough questions and i thought to myself as i'm like doing the interview and just like as an interviewer like if i'm gonna have a brand as media and as a League of Legends interviewer, I need to have a brand. And I'm not gonna be the softball guy. There is already a softball guy. No offense, but that's Travis. Travis, you are the softball guy. So I didn't want to be the Korean He's Travis. He's done it now. He's actually gone and said it. He called him out. Right, I want this, someone make a clip right now. It goes on Reddit with the title, there is a softball guy, that's Travis. So it's someone along those lines. No, don't actually do that. Cause technically softball. I'm not supposed to tell people the Reddit yeah. stuff, but you know, whatever. Oh. You all understand. So anyways. You all understand. I was like, okay, since there is already a softball guy and there is people interviewing this way, like I want to ask the tough questions. I want to ask the hard questions. So I kind of pressured Darshan on why the team is so shitty and like what's going on with the team. And he gave like a decent answer. And I asked him even tougher question on top of that. Like, don't you think, but this teammate is doing really badly. And he gave really great answers, but that was probably like the roughest interview where I knew I was stepping on eggshells and I knew I'm putting a player in an uncomfortable position to maybe speak badly of his team. And Darshan handled sure. it really well. See, I don't actually think I've ever had an interview that was like bad in that sense. But I actually think it's because I know I have like a secret to how I ask for the interview, which pre-selects people who are going to give a decent interview. So what I do is this, is if I ask for it, like, for example, if I had to play the hired beef with all that I'd criticized, I would still ask them to do an interview. Because actually, when I do the interview, I'm obviously not going to be like abrasive in the interview and be like, you shit or whatever. I'm going to ask in a much more polite manner than I would if it was just me giving my own opinion. So first of all, it might be a great interview. Like maybe they can give me all sorts of great answers to things I was critical of, you know, and I'd get a perspective I never got. But the, the secret is this. When I ask someone like that, who I know like would have good reason to say no, basically, I don't just say like, can we do an interview? What I do is I, I'll ask it like in one of two ways. I'll either say something like, hey, you know, I'll, like, I'll basically I'll explain what I just said there. Like, you know, I know in the past, you know, we've probably publicly had a very rocky relationship, but I'd be really interested actually to know what some of your responses would be to some of the criticisms. I'd love to give you a chance to, you know, speak on some of the aspects and address them directly and people then might be able to see like what your perspective is. I either ask it that. And then what I do is I either say, are you up for it? Because that's a very specific phrasing. Like, if you're really not anywhere at all, you'll say, no, nah, I'm not really. In which case, because mm -hmm. I've asked it in that way, I can't then be like, oh, fucking ass. It's like, oh, okay, if you're not in fit, don't worry about it. Or I just say this. I say, 
do you have any time this week? Because that's another great question, Local. Because what's great about that is you're not actually asking, do they have time? What you're saying is, can you make some extra time for me, basically? And so if they were to say, well, actually, I don't have any time this week, that's a very reasonable way to let them let you down mm -hmm. without making a big fix. So what I'm basically not going to do is make them say, no, I don't want to do an interview with you. I don't like you and I'm upset. You know, like, that's mm -hmm. not good for anyone. So what I do is I, I have, like, a way of asking where if they say yes to any of those two, then they're probably into it, actually. Like, maybe they're up for it and it's like the angle the angle's going to be good. If they say no to that, you just let it be. You just mm -hmm. go, out. that's not that's not the right one for me. So believe it or not, it's actually a fact. No one has I ever walked out of any interview I've ever done. No one's ever, as far as I know, regretted it. But it's because I'm very careful on how I set it up mm. first. I feel like that whole spiel you just said is very relatable to also dating. But you just, <laughs> when you're asking someone else out on a date, it's just like, give them a nice way to reject you. don't want to put too much pressure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah it's really, really good. It's really good. Yeah. <laughs> Love Are you really learning good. something? I'm learning. <laughs> mm. See, local, like what you don't do, mate, is you don't just say like, hey, um, are you free like any day this week? And then they're like, oh, I'm not free on Wednesday. But what about Thursday, Friday, I'm, I'm Friday, Saturday, Sunday? And then like, as soon as you say that, like the person's just like, this guy's a fucking loser. He's got nothing going on. Like, it's how you say things. Like, well, no, just, I just usually so ask funny. like, yo, I'm hanging out with my friends on Thursday. You should come by. And then like, you should come hang with us like as a group. Because I think like taking a girl on a one-on-one -on -one first date is actually... Like a lot of pressure. It's You're one of the big. Right, get that soylent gas out again and start drinking. <laughs> from it, you absolute wreck of a human being. Go right. on, Thomas. And then oh, after, you know, after, having, like a one -on having a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a girl's too intense for me right now. I gotta have my friend. Like, yeah, you fucking for real. Think, oh, it's always better with your friends. It's like, yeah, you're, you're you hang out. What you, are you talking about? You hang out as a group casually, and then if you really vibe with the girl, then you can ask her to hang out one-on-one, -on -one, or okay. you can even, Lovely. you know, you, you can know even slip off in one-on-one -on -one in a group. What? This is why you got your reputation as ha of what? having like a harem all the time. I don't have a harem. That's so bullshit. Oh my goodness. People say that all the time. I don't have a harem. He, he's right. He doesn't have a harem because in the harem concept in anime, they all want to actually sleep with the guy. <laughs> he has like a harem where none of them are going to sleep with him, but oh he just God. wants to believe he has a chance. He's like that guy out of Dom and Dom. He just wants the 0.1% chance. If he just has that, that alone, he'll just hold the candle to some motherfucker for like 10 years on that. Like, <laughs> so is there a chance to get it correct I thought, I thought he was actually gonna no. go with a weird creepier version i thought he was gonna say like what i do is i just ask them to hang out as a friend and then when they get there i'm like oh yeah my other friends couldn't make it uh, i guess i guess it's just the two of us huh? no. <laughs> wait a second that's wait. what happened with us you said your friends canceled there we go no, oh no, my no. god I can't believe it. It. screw you <laughs> lisa screw you oh, <laughs> I'm okay, so my actual love life goes something like this. Like, oh my god, I cannot. I'm very. I'm someone that's not emotionally available right now because I am a damaged. I'm. I there. There's a black hole. <laughs> Double my, lift ruined you. Yeah, there's oh. a there's a black yeah, hole where my heart should be. So I cannot like have a romantic relationship with someone. So I just hang out as a group, and I've generally been turning people down due to not being emotionally available at the moment. So I just want to get it correct for all the fans watching. Okay. And I don't want rumors being spread. I can only imagine when local gets into a really serious relationship where somebody's going to say, listen, it's about time I told you the truth about my problems, okay? Because the problem is, in order to take the next step, this is going to sound really weird. And I don't want, you know, hear me out. I don't want you to put, you know, to dismiss me and reject me immediately. But we're going to have to have uh, sort of like couples therapy with this individual. And they'll sold up a picture of like double lift when I see on the jersey. It's gonna, we're going to need to talk a lot with this individual. Like, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. Who is that? Like, is that oh like a God. therapist? Or no, no, he's just a guy who used to play with this <laughs> five years ago. Okay, what would the problem be? Yeah, I've never, just never got over it. Uh, yeah. Very deep, a lot of problem. I'm hurt inside still. And uh, if, if I. Could you, could you maybe help me talk to him? And then they're like, I don't know, this is too weird for me. Mm. <laughs> well, Lisa, what was your toughest interview? Uh, <laughs> nice segue. That was barely one. Um, <laughs> I would, Double Lift surprisingly, actually not surprisingly, gives great interviews. So mm -hmm. I, just, Loco, I think you should actually think about doing an interview with him. Oh because you guys are so awkward, it would be- I think it could work. Yeah. I think we should make this happen. I'm just saying. But that's a side note. Um, I, uh, the two interviews that came up in my mind first, First one, do you remember Matt from the support player from yeah, Liquid? Yeah, I used yes. to coach him. Yeah, uh, I remember one interview, but this stuck with my mind, like, in my mind so clearly. I remember grabbing him, I think it was after a loss, can't remember who exactly. But the first question, you know, you ask like, oh, um, so like, you know, you guys lost. Uh, what did you feel like coming into this match, whatever. Gave him the mic and he literally looks at me and was like, I already answered this on stage. And I'm just like, 
<laughs> oh well, I maybe just answer. Know. Just ask again for the viewers who are watching this video. Like, it, you know what I mean? And he, I give it back to him, and luckily he answered. But I was like, damn, that's a sassy reply. That moment stuck in my head forever. <laughs> the other person, not surprisingly, probably is Dardock. Oh shit. He's actually no, he's like good because he's so open in a mm. sense. You know, when he's vulnerable, he's vulnerable. You can feel it. Mm. But it also is so awkward when he's upset mm. and he's on that edge. Even Darshan too. They're like very emotional people. So when you're interviewing them on a bad note, mm -hmm. you feel bad. Mm -hmm. And those really stuck out in my mind. But they weren't necessarily the worst. The Matt thing was probably the worst thing that happened. Because mm -hmm. in my head, I'm like, oh, damn, he's going to be sassy this whole interview. Better just make it like, you know what I mean? Sharp, que sharp questions, get it over with, move on. Because he doesn't want to be here, obviously. Mm -hmm. So that well, was on the on the upside, he'll never have to do another interview on stage. So that's pro that's pro oh! so that problem, isn't it? So there we go. There you go, Matt. What do you know, karma? Oh, yeah. Speaking of esport media, I think esport media is in like a really, really bad spot. Every time I do interviews, I lose money. I have to pay for the Uber to go to LCS. I have to pay for the camera guy. And people have no idea how like money works in content creation. So like a lot of my money comes from sponsorship from past and like ad revenue on Twitch, ad revenue for YouTube is actually so shitty. And people are like, oh, Loco, listen, Loco is doing so well. Like you must be making tons of money. No, like I'm losing money. Like recently we um, are finalizing steps to a sponsorship. So we're evening, we're starting to even out and make money. But the amount of money that goes into editors, like travel and just everything like you lose money as an independent content content creator and an independent interviewer so when i talk to people like that also do interviews like outside of travis and like people working for espn and invent like people working for score shot caller like all these smaller companies it's so rough like a lot of mm -hmm. them like are doing it by interview by interview basis and they're barely making any money and they're not being able to develop their own brand Name me interviewers outside of me and Travis and Emily and Fionn, like outside of the ESPN and then outside of me and Travis, like you guys can't name eSport interviewers. And these people like show up to LCS every single day. Sometimes they don't even get an interview and they lose money doing it. It's so I mean, rough. hundred percent. That's why, you know, with the score, if you follow the way they did content, like the first year, their main focus was doing interviews because that was what looked like the audience wanted. Mm -hmm. But I think over time, the score was really smart because they realized, you know what, we're putting a lot of money into doing interviews. Some of the interviews do amazing, right? But then most of them actually do pretty poorly, like a thousand mm -hmm. views. And we're paying, we were doing at, a, at that time, like EU as well, mm -hmm. and NA, where we were having Scara and Marcel. Like we had big names doing our interviews, but even then that didn't bring in huge reviews all the time. Mm -hmm. So they were smart to realize that early. And they're like, you know what? Interviews were great at the beginning, <coughs> but obviously the audience, maybe there's too many interviewers out there, right? Mm -hmm. We need to switch our content plan now. And then they switched over to doing all the biographical stories mm -hmm. and that took off for them and did so well. And then they so slowly phased out the interviews, which is weird because once they started phasing it out, people started coming up and being like, where are the interviews? Mm -hmm. But like, where were they when we were doing interviews? Yes. Right? And there weren't so much we of them. <laughs> That's the thing. Yeah. We did probably like one or two each week, but we were regular, but no one were watching them. But when we stopped doing them, people wanted them. So like mm -hmm. reading the audience in league and esports in general is so difficult because I think with every game, it's very different. I'm pro probably with CSGO. I don't know what the audience, you know, really is drawn to Thorin. Maybe it's interviews or an analysis videos, but like... Yeah. It's tough. It's tough in every game because that's the other thing. Like different communities definitely respond differently. Like, like I'll give you one of the weirdest examples. If <laughs> if you listen to what fans say they want, like what they on Reddit would claim they wanted, like in CS:GO for example, they always try to act like they're like really pretentious, like they're all big mega brains. Like, oh, I only want incredibly tactical, in-depth <laughs> breakdowns of you know. Except they're liars because anyone who does that content, it doesn't do very well. And so bizarrely, a game like League, which is viewed as being very casual and it's just, oh, it's all just idiots playing like a little wizard who just, sort of, believe it or not, League is way more actually uh, receptive towards like, like quite in-depth, like written content and stuff. I'm not sure why, like there's a lot of side tangents you could go on there. Like maybe for example, more Americans are into League. And so maybe they look at that stuff when they're at work or school and you can just read something. It's a lot easier than watching a video if you're in class, you know, you pull it up. I don't know what the context would be, but there's definitely like a divide in terms of what content they want. Whereas for example, in CSGO, it's way more likely that the clips on Reddit right now are like just highlight clips of the game and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like even my videos, like some of them will do well, some of them won't do that well. But like, it's a bit depressing because it does mean there's certain types of content that like I would almost tell someone 
do it if you want to do it, but you're not guaranteed to get success doing that with this particular audience, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you guys think that interviews are just like it's oversaturated in esports media and content now? Like it's kind of the bottom of the, I guess, content barrel. So for the interview to do well, and like in terms of oversaturation, like some interviews will do well, right? And for the interview to do well, it has to be a great player, a great headline. And also a great... Loco, let's be real. Like, you're right on that, right? First of all, when he says, like, great player, like, if it is double if double yokes, like, yeah, that is a guaranteed killer, mm. right? But the problem is this. There are some very, very good players. Like, for, so for example, I'll pick someone who's a very good player, but not as big a name. So, like, Licorice from Cloud9. Mm -hmm. It's not guaranteed if you do an interview with Licorice that that'll get, like, front page. Yeah. So at that point, now what you need is, and this is what no one wants to hear, but it's true, you need a clickbait he headline. Yeah. Every fan who ever says in the comments, oh, why is there a clickbait headline? You wouldn't even have seen this interview yourself if it didn't have a click. If the headline was, I know this is a fact, if the headline just said interview with Licorice after his match, mm -hmm. no one's clicking on that. It's not getting up for it. That's the one that's going to die on the new page with like minus 10 volts or something. Mm -hmm. The only reason it gets up there is exactly because it's got a headline that grabs your attention or you can discuss in the comments or someone who's a fan can latch on to. Mm -hmm. I want to clarify the word clickbait because this word triggers me so much because mm -hmm. when we did a lot of interviews, we at the score, uh, the headline, we would choose like a good quote, right? Mm -hmm. And then everyone would say that's clickbait. But I just want to clarify a catchy, like a uh, spicy headline quote from the actual interview is not clickbait. That's an engaging title. Clickbait is when you literally say, you would never guess what they said when we asked about Faker. That's yes. clickbait because there's no <laughs> actual sand, like there's no truth of that mm -hmm. in the video, right? Like you don't know. Mm -hmm. When they use that to fish you in, that's clickbait, you mm -hmm. know, like or five top reasons why you can't do that. That's clickbait. But mm -hmm. when we literally pull a quote from the actual video, that mm -hmm. is not clickbait. And that was something that was so annoying with Reddit that no one seems to really understand. Yes. The moment they see like you put a player <coughs> name with another player name, for some reason that's called clickbait, and we're trying to like fake like fake people or draw people in, in in a bad way like no that's not how it works but for some reason the audience they kept calling it clickbait and that made me really annoyed you know what the problem is when you go to the interviews and you click the interviews <laughs> on reddit there's like a title right a very engaging title and none of the comments are about um none of the comments are about the actual fucking interview itself it's about the title and that's the only thing that really matters and that's the only thing that people are really talking about and I think that's a huge problem. The fact that the title itself is the topic and is the entire interview. But that's kind of maybe the reflection on the audience nowadays. You know, nowadays we're just interested in very quick bits. We don't want to listen to a 10 minute interview. Yes. We want the line and then we want to talk about that line. Like mm -hmm. that maybe is just how the audience is nowadays. Just or maybe hot just take culture, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. And maybe that's something as media we need to understand. But at the same time, we want our audience to be smart consumers, right? Mm -hmm, sure. And that's the hope for just people in general when you're reading the news you don't want to just take the headline and run mm -hmm. with it you want to read the story so it's kind of like both i guess media and consumers have to be very aware they have to understand that the headline is literally just a summary of the whole piece mm -hmm. and that's i don't know how do we educate people so that they are aware like is that really the media's responsibility or a lot here's the thing a lot of the times i've noticed because I, whenever i see comments i always try to think like where's the person coming from when they make this comment mm -hmm. a lot of the times that they say clickbait it's usually someone who's like so i'll give you an example say like the say it was a licorice interview right and i'll give you like a spicy clickbait headline say his headline was like you know impact will never be as good as me on carries or something like that you know what happens is then it's a team liquid fan who goes, this is just fucking clickbait. This, why is this allowed on subreddit? Like, cause really what he's mad at is just, he, it doesn't like the sentiment that someone seems to have trash talked a player he likes. Mm -hmm. So he then thinks that's unfair, but, it isn't at all. I mean, to give you an analogy, okay, so the movie everyone wants to see right now is obviously Avengers Endgame, right? Yes. Like, if that same movie was called a group of superheroes <laughs> fight against an incredibly powerful supervillain and the world is at stake, that's a way more descriptive and accurate title. It's a terrible fucking title for a movie. No one would go see this movie. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, if someone was like, Avengers Endgame, that's just fucking clickbait. I don't even know what that means. Where's the context? Endgame, endgame of what? So you're saying it's the endgame of the Avengers, are you? Like, no, none of that stuff. Like, it's just the title, isn't it? It's catchy to bring you in. Mm -hmm. The idea is you're going to see the rest once you go into the movie, aren't you? In the same way, if any of you ever clicked the interview, you'd actually know what he said. You'd know if it was a legit comment, of course. <sighs> yeah.
I mean, interviews are, to go back, like, why I think interviews are in a really rough spot. Like, if you're starting out, if you're not with a big org, it's even hard to get a media pass. And then even when you get a media pass, if you're not with, like, a big org, um, players don't want to do interviews with you. And even if you get the interview with a big player as a small org, it's hard to make it up on Reddit. There are just so many things that are preventing interviewers from, like, actually getting into the space. And I've been very lucky and very fortunate that team I have previous connections with teams and they've been... Um, giving me interviews with players, I really do appreciate it. And that ride has been giving me a media pass, but I can't imagine like anyone else trying to start and be an interviewer in the space. Let us let me ask you this. Do you think Ovali would have been successful if Travis didn't help her, if Travis didn't give her the platform, and if Travis didn't kind of give her the connections required to get interviews with players and like put her face out there and put her stuff out there, she would have never been successful. Not because she wasn't talented, not because she wasn't working hard. It's just nearly impossible to get into the space right now. A hundred percent. I mean, a lot of it, but like we can say that, but the reality is having connections and accessibility is part of being successful. You know, yes. if you know the right people, you're in the right yeah. place, <clears throat> you're going to have a better advantage over someone else. And that's just the way it is. So like, yeah, maybe she wouldn't be where she is without Travis and his connections, but at the end of the day, she was there and mm -hmm. now she's doing her job and she's getting better every day. Right. Which is, you can't, you know, hate on her for that. No, I don't. But, I think she's talented yeah. and she's doing a great job. I'm just saying it's not. It's very hard. Yeah, it's very hard. Even when you have the talent, when you are also working hard, like just due to. How I think she makes right a good now. point though, because the point she's making there is like, basically, okay. I'll give you. I'll give you the analogy. You know what I said about before when you got upset when you were the TSM coach, where you just wanted to be judged on the fact that no, I do have the game knowledge to be a coach. Mm -hmm. But what Monty's point was, which is actually a good point, is there's more to coaching than just that. Like for example, mm -hmm. part of being a coach in the position you were in is you have to be a leader of a bunch of other young men. So if you are a young man yourself, it's going to be really hard to do that. Maybe you don't have the experience to do it. In a similar sense, I was in this position myself a long time ago in esports local because I was someone who came from the very very early days where everyone mm -hmm. was like. Basically, the only reason you did journalism stuff is you were super nerd for the game. You loved everything about the game. You were obsessed with it. So back then, I used to use the same bullshit, like self-talk myself. Like if someone else was successful, but I knew they didn't know that much about the game, I would be like, oh, they've obviously just like fucking just like, that's like nepotism mm -hmm. or, you know, they're just like fake, you know, and all that. And it's because what I was doing was the one area I could beat them in is I knew more about the game. So what I did is I acted like that was the only factor that matters and dismissed everything else but what i actually learned over time was what they're doing obviously it, like i would i spun it the other way and i thought wait a minute if they don't know about the game but they have some success they're doing something right actually why don't i just figure out whatever else they're doing add it to my skill set and then surely i would be more successful right mm -hmm. and that is a way better way to think so what i would say to tie it in is if you were a beginning person who's trying to break in doing interviews actually basically lisa's just it implied what you should do, which is say you're stuck in that press room local talked about and you're not getting any interviews. First of all, use your time you're in that press room. Start talking to the other press. Ask them stuff. Oh, what? I'm having a tough time getting in. Ask for advice. Ask for tips. See if you can get someone who will vouch for you after knowing you for a few weeks. If you get one interview, parlay that into another one. Now, you know, that guy's team manager, you get to know him, you get an interview with another player. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a grind for sure. But then again, I'm with you, right? In, in theory, I don't want to block new people coming in the industry, but you also don't just get to like come in and be at the same level Travis is at. Like you mm -hmm. have to earn your way up as well. Actually, I'm curious, what do you guys think about the new, I guess, era or wave of, I guess, journalists coming into the scene? Those who don't come from exactly an esports background, like they studied maybe journalism or whatever, and they're coming into the scene with ESPN, all those big outlets. You guys think it's good that there's this new wave? No, nah, get them out. Kick her out the channel now. <laughs> get, get her the fuck out. We, don't, we can't, no space for people like this. The fake pauses, you know. No, the thing is, actually, there's a lot of people mm -hmm. like that. that. By the way, that is a sign. Mm -hmm. I know at the moment, because media in general is doing badly, that's also one of the things that has a knock-on effect on esports media because there's so little money to invest. But actually, a, po a very positive sign for esports is that the people with journalism degrees now give esports a crack. When, back in the old days, part of the reason there aren't many people from my era around is even when there were people good back then, if they got good, they would just go and get a real journalism job. They would immediately <laughs> exit the industry. There was no reason to stay because there wasn't enough money. There wasn't any fame in it. You know, there's nothing special to do except if you just really love the game. So mm -hmm. actually, I think personally, it's a positive that people who actually, in theory, want to just be journalists in general, then say, well, I like esports games as well, so I'll give the industry a crack. The only problem is, I will say like a lot of them seem to struggle immediately because they think 
it's like it's like every other job, right? People who go to college always because they haven't had real life experience think, right, going to the university is what's going to get me my job. They think, right, when I get the degree, the employer will see my degree and they'll see it, right, that's like my foot in the door. And the problem is in esports, like your degree in journalism doesn't really help. It doesn't get you the first step in. You still start at zero. So it's still good. Like you probably learned some skills that if you had no skills at all, you'd, you'd be way ahead of them. But mm -hmm. I don't know that it gets you your foot in the door still. I think that part's the hot, tough part is to get your break, basically. Mm. Mm. I think I'm probably one of the examples where luckily I did have a journalism journalism degree but also a little knowledge on the games because i remember in my interview at the score um you know they asked about my background past jobs so mainly they were like which is, which team is your favorite who's your favorite player which game like they then started kind of honing in on like the games and the teams like do i actually follow or am i just here for you know a job mm -hmm. do i actually have a passion for it so it's kind of now a mix they look for both mm -hmm. which then narrows it down a lot but sure. it's kind of cool at the same time. It's like now there's opportunities for people who are actually, you know, journalism backgrounds, but also gaming background. And there's a lot of opportunities for that. But of course, you know, that's a threat to Loco. So I know he could be worried about that. But it's okay. You know, I like, just keep doing what you're doing, Loco. You're doing great. Oh, man. Yeah, I feel very threatened. And I'm very glad <laughs> that you're no longer in the interview space. And now you're in the hosting space. Thank you, Whoa! Loco. Whoa! Listen, only temporarily. Anytime she wants, she can just dive right in and scoop up all your shit, mate. She'll be getting interviews with Double F tomorrow. What are you talking about? Sure, sure. First of all, she actually has an amiable personality. You've got to overcome your personality just doing interviews, you know. Like, I, th I think fair play to you trying to work on your weaknesses, but, you know. Okay. Actually, that is, you know, that is one thing, though, by the way, mm. that I would actually say is a massive positive. If you want to come into the industry and you're not someone who was like an expert about the game, you didn't follow the game for 10 years, I think a strength that you have that I've noticed is you have like a natural enthusiasm when you talk to people. Yeah. So that naturally makes people open up a little bit more, get them into more of like a fun vibe. The problem is someone who comes in, if they're like very nervous or they don't know how to like act on camera, they don't have camera presence, for example, which I think you've actually always had from when I've seen your stuff with the score. It's going to be a lot, lot tougher than for them to like make the first leap. Whereas if you have like something like that, like for example, I'm sure when you did your first interviews, especially because you're with like an official media company, you've got like a, a nice bobbly personality. I'm sure that even just made some of the first interviews, like they just went a bit lighter on you. They didn't think you had to give you a super in-depth answer, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, my first interviews, I think it was Madison Square Garden, NALCS finals. They threw us right in. One. Yeah. Oh, it was so good, but I was just winning the game. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Shit. Three zero. Three zero. Zip them up. Put them in a bag. There we go. Yeah, I, Look, no. I didn't see you there. Where were you? Um. <laughs> Crying in the back. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, they literally threw us right in. But luckily, with journalism, see, that's the thing I guess journalism really taught me is like you don't have to be an expert of your topic, but if you do your research, have your kind of like skeleton of questions go in and anything you don't know you can own up to it and be like i don't yes. know it so explain it to me like you're the yes. one who's playing the game you're the only expert i'm just here to have you talk and explain your point right so that was something i took into every interview and you have to be kind of humble about it like i'm not here to be an expert that's you mm -hmm. talk to me about what your expertise so luckily that worked for me and i think that's a journalism i guess strength right you go into every interview you don't have to be an expert just know as much as you can and then just talk to them they're a person treat them yes. like a person <laughs> yes. which i know some people find it hard to do if you're not uh, trained or just naturally like that so as a content creator it's really important to just don't get stuck in your head you're talking to a person anything you don't know just ask you're literally there to ask questions mm. and i uh, guess for yeah go ahead <laughs> um, so well super hot topic so when I started in Korea and the OGM producers and the writers, they really took good care of me and they gave me a lot of advice. And one thing they told me was stay away from journalists and be careful of journalists and to maintain distance from journalists. And then one thing I also noticed is even in teams, like people still have like a little bit of hesitancy being really close with journalists. And one thing that I heard um, ESPN people say was it's very unprofessional as a journalist to like go to like a team party or like a social gathering like outside of that and that's kind of and I know for a fact there's journalists like in the LCS scene that wants to be closer to players so there's always been like this weird like I guess distance <coughs> that players are expected to keep up journalists and I kind of want to get you and Dorian's point of view on that because I've always just been taught that way and I'm not sure if it should be so. And I personally don't keep 
a very big distance between me and the players because one i already know the players like from before so i never felt like i had to do that is that an actual thing journalists <coughs> needing to keep distance from players and players also wanting to actively not be close friends with journalists that's a really tough one. That's a really tough. Well, first of all, Loco, you're in a different position because you didn't start off as a journalist or content creator, right? Like you were one of them until you turned into one of us. <laughs> so <laughs> that's different. Whereas for, I guess maybe, I don't know what Thorin, but for me, like I came from the outside coming into this world. Um, obviously from a journalistic perspective, you always want to remain neutral. Mm -hmm. You never want to, when you report something, you never want to be biased. Yes, that's like one of the main tenets of journalism. But at the same time, from the content that I was creating, I felt it more like I wasn't doing hardcore reporting journalism, right? I wasn't breaking news about secret rosters or any of that stuff. I was there to facilitate a conversation and I felt like it was beneficial to obviously have a positive relationship with these players. I wasn't, you know, you know, like texting, talking secrets with them all the time, but I wanted to remain, remain a good, have a good rapport with them. And I think that's perfectly fine. Um, Though, if I were to be in a position, maybe like Jacob Wolf, where he's doing more like hardcore reporting, it would be different than to accept, I don't know, favors or be close friends with people, because then that gets messy. But for me, I think it's good to have a positive relationship with players and the people you're interviewing, because obviously you get better interviews. Like if they are comfortable with you, that's great. Like mm -hmm. I want people to always be comfortable with me. They don't have to be my best friend, but I do want to have a good relationship with them. So that's kind of the line I drew when I was doing interviews. Thorin, how sure. about you? Well, the thing is, I actually, people probably don't know this because in League of Legends, like I've been a very prominent like personality and given a lot of commentary and editorial comments as well aside from interviews. But when I actually, it was in esports for the first like decade or so of my career, I actually never used to do any opinion based content. I never used to do columns, never used to do like my own thoughts and things. Obviously, Twitter didn't exist for most of that time. So any opinions I had would have generally been in private. And I actually used to, for that very reason, purposely try to make it just like professional. Mm -hmm. So if I ever did an interview, it were all very, very straight along, straight edge questions. There was no banter in there, nothing edgy. And I will say it definitely made it so that like, for example, like I never had any problems with players, like no players turned down interviews. And it was great in that sense, like it maximized the reach that you had and how many people would do it. But the problem with it was over, over time, I started to introduce other aspects, like giving my own thoughts and things. And I did notice very quickly, like, yeah, obviously then it pisses a player off and he doesn't want to interview with you or someone does an interview and they have a different attitude when they do the interview with you. So I will say that like, it's like you it's like you have to weigh it up as a compromise to be made there like in my opinion if you want to also give your own opinions you're gonna have to basically accept that you're gonna lose some potential interviews as a result like if you only want to do interviews yeah just stay 100 percent. like keep it totally clean in that sense don't let them know if you like or don't like them or what your biases are but since i wanted to do the other stuff as well it's like that comes with the territory and then the last thing i'd say is that's why I made the very clear distinction earlier that it's very different when I interview a player, how I would ask him a question than how I would make the same point if it was on a video where he's not there or it was like a talk show like this. Like the difference is if I ask a question in interviews, I'm almost never gonna like really press the point too much. Like if they, if, like for example, if I ask them a question and they dodge the question, I might say, well, you know, like you didn't really answer the question and ask again. But like if they just make it clear, like I don't want to answer this question, or something I'm gonna say, then that's it. That's the end. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. you, you can't really force them to answer you. You can't be too kind of argumentative. So I would just say in interviews, I go into it already knowing like I can't be like my persona in the interview. So there's, it's a, it's tricky. There's a lot of like, it's like you've got to really know where you're at to know how to respond to people. But I would say as general advice, it's good advice. Like I actually, I know I've, I've told local this in the past. It's the same for coaches. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest mistakes that people made in coaching early in League of Legends is cause all the people who were coaches were ex pro players. Mm -hmm. So they came, they were not only came from the community of pro players, they, they still thought they were in that community. And so there are some mad stories in the early days of LCS, both EU and NA of stuff like the coach and the player are both chasing after the same girl at an after party. Like that's just a recipe for disaster, no matter who wins out there. Like think it through. Oh, you know, one of the coaches is now dating the ex-girlfriend of one of his players. It's like, these are examples of where like, you know what, I'm sure there's a scenario where that could work, but like you can just see as an outsider, like that's not even worth the hassle for anyone. Like just stay away from all that because the potential for that to ruin everything is so, so huge. Yeah. Lisa thoughts? But that's actually hilarious. Loco, why were you laughing so hard, huh? Because oh, you were laughing and it was a funny joke. I wanted to just laugh. You know, it's social cues. Follow along. 
joke or you have stories to tell? Because see, my journalism know. vibes are tingling there. I can tell there's I a story. To, no, I, 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 I did have a very. Mm, I used to be a lot more looser in the past regarding people I was seeing and people I was dating. And then once oh, I. Shit. <laughs> Keep going. Oh, sorry. Did I react there? Keep going. Yeah. That was supposed to be internally. Yeah. So yeah. And once I realized like how much drama it was causing and how like shallow these relationships are, just for me and also for the person <laughs> after me, I was like, I yeah. Can't this guy. What? What? Right. Listen, I could believe the first part that yeah. you actually realized. You know, this is destroying some of my like work relationships. I've got to be more professional. The part you tried to add in there, where it was like, it was just a lot of meaningless sex as well. And, you know, <laughs> no, it was just shallow. shallow. It was just shallow as a relationship. I transcended these like superficial uh, relationships. You know, I want like a spiritual connection with someone. I want someone who appreciates me for who I am, not just like who I'm trying to be in the club. You know. And so the thing is, like, I've just moved on as a person. Like, that's like, that was some. But listen, save that shit for your diary, mate. We don't need your lies. <laughs> <laughs> keep with the truth so anyway you couldn't get any of these women anymore and you realize <laughs> that is, I'm, I'm oh ruining everything with my players so oh Reggie's told me this is my last chance and this, I'm third, three strikes and I'm out so as long as I can stay in this one this is fine oh my god and I'm, should I and, but, I'm, but, I but the thing you. is Reggie I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna unsubscribe from their Instagrams can I still like their Instagram pictures <laughs> who am I you like Dorian that's you you're the whore <laughs> no here's the thing though Here's the thing, Loco, and you, and as we mentioned on the liquid oh. pyro topic, here's the difference. The reason why it's not weird when I like Instagram pictures, Loco, is because I'm just up front. I like the pictures. I, I, I like, like the girls I women. like, but yeah, what exactly. It? Okay, to I get... like seeing attractive women, hot women, oh my God. women in general, like love women. Don't know if you're aware of that. Okay, so if I see a good picture, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sitting back like, oh, rack my brain. Oh, what, what message will they take if I put a like? I don't give a fuck. I hit the little like and I move on with my day. Okay. and if they're sat thinking about it, guess what? That's their fault, isn't it? So they better level their game up, like oh my fault, and get back in the game. To get back on topic, I felt like. <laughs> But if it dating within esport had its cons with it, and also as a coach, and also just as someone getting older, I felt like there I wasn't getting a lot out of it. So I made sure to maintain distance from people in esports, and I usually dated on um, friends of friends that I know outside of esports, or friends of friends of friends where it's beyond esports, and it is incredibly messy dating in esports. <sighs> yeah, I think that's obviously a symptom of you know esports going through that transition of being very like gr grassroots to now professional. So you obviously went through that whole phase and now you realize now that you're working in this and it's a job is on the line, your reputation's on the line, mm -hmm. it's not worth it to get emotions and all that messy stuff. And that applies, I think, going back to media, like as a person working in the industry, it's very important to maintain that line mm -hmm. where if you're gonna be working in this industry, you don't want personal feelings to get invested. Mm -hmm. So that as well, speaking of media, as a woman in this industry, every interview Oof. I do, there are always comments underneath being like, they fucked afterwards, or they <laughs> obviously dated every single time. See, that's the crazy thing, right? Just as a, but anyways. So the point is, it's very important, whether you're a woman or a male, to maintain that kind of professionalism, that line, so that no one can question your integrity when you're doing content. And I think that's By also- way, just as an aside, just to make me happy, can people who are watching this chat now, anytime you see one of Loco's interviews, just always put in the comments, like, I'm, I bet they fucked up for this. Like, you can tell by the way Loco smiled, they fought, just to make it funny, because it'll be a great throwback to this, and everyone will be like, what? Are they even Wait, together? What? are you guys telling me you guys never get that comment? What? Exactly. Uh, not, Shocking. Yeah, not, not as often as you, Lisa, but I still do get it, <laughs> especially when I interview TSM players. I get it all the time. See, maybe the tension is actually sexual tension between you guys. Maybe, Ooh. maybe. Well, <laughs> Lisa, then let me ask you. Like, then let me ask you this question. So, let's say there is like a young female interviewer coming up. Like, would you give them the advice to not date a player, even though that would, what if it give her so much like skyrocket in terms of like actually getting to where she wants to get in terms of being relevant in the scene? Like, if they need to grind it out, there's a huge chance they don't make it. Like. If it is like two consenting adults, like is there a problem with it? 
Well, so basically you're asking me, is it okay to sleep your way to the top? Uh, no, and I'm not. I would say, that's you not are right. asking that. Well, here's the thing. Look, let's do both versions. Like, no. one, <laughs> what do you think of that as a topic? Because obviously that is yeah. a real thing. Some people yeah. think it's a viable strategy as well, by the way. And like, it clearly works in certain industries. Mm -hmm. One, you can give your thoughts on that. But I think he just means more like, even if you just, like, even if you just literally just wanted a boyfriend, like you're not mm -hmm. literally going to sleep with your boss and go, you just wanted a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. But the problem is he's a pro player. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a problem? So there's kind of two, two questions. I mean, it so kind of is. Well, okay. So the second <laughs> question i think it is an issue if you want to maintain a level of integrity as a journalist you know you kind of have to make a decision there if you want to continue being a journalist that has a great reputation very unbiased then you can't make that decision to go date someone that you will interview you know mm -hmm. but if you feel it's more important to pursue that relationship don't be an interviewer or a journalist for a while date them you know find a job in something else figure it out and if that doesn't work out go back to what you need to do you know you just have to decide it's not an some people want it all but sometimes you just have to choose a, a lane or choose a path and follow that through. But it has to be a choice, I think. I don't know. You know, even in traditional sports, if there's a journalist that ever ends up dating a player, they mm -hmm. lose their job. Like, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. And I think it's to maintain that integrity as a journalist. And that's something you have to know as a journalist going into it. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. So it's up to the person to make that decision. I don't think one way is wrong or the other way is wrong. But mm -hmm. it is. I think you have to make that choice. Um, going back to the other question, <laughs> sleeping way to the top is obviously very effective in some ways, but then if that's, it, it isn't rewarding if what you're looking for is a meaningful, mm -hmm. I guess, career, you know, once again, it's your decisions cause a certain chain reaction. You know, if you sleep with someone to the top, you make it up there, you didn't practice your craft, the content you create is not going to be as yeah. great. You know, like, it's just, the, that's just what happens. <clears throat> Whereas if you want to actually be a great journalist and creating great content is what you want to do, you got to put in those hours. You got to do those interviews and not sleep your way through the top. Mm, so sure. it's once again, you just have to make <clears throat> that kind of decision, you know? Mm. Like, I, I have a you... different take on this one, oh. Okay. So on the angle of like, should women in esports, especially if they do like on camera role, or mm. for example, a role where you're going to interact with lots of players, will it affect like credibility, for example, or mm. will people think of you differently if they know that you date another player mm. who in their scene, like a teammate or player they play against, or even if it's a player in another esports game, they just know that you date within esports, right? The problem with that topic is, if you're just a guy, and especially if you've never thought this through, it's really easy to think to yourself, Kind of like when it's kind of, you might think naively that it's like the example I gave earlier of a coach dating in the same field of people as his player, right? <laughs> the problem in that scenario is it seems stupid that the coach should do it because you say to the coach, come on, dude, there's only like five girls who have to not date all of their girlfriends or their exes. <laughs> like you can date anyone else. Just don't mm -hmm. date those people. Like that's different. The reason why I actually think it's unreasonable to say to women, like don't date anyone in esports is because if you look at how women in modern culture pick who they're going to date, they pick people who are in their environment, who are around them. That's mm -hmm. who they're interacting with. That's who they're talking to. That's who the available pool of people they can choose from is so if their life is esports and they're at esports events all the time and their friends are all in esports and every physical event they go to except like the shops or something like that is esports that's just who's naturally going to be who they look at and who they potentially pick a partner someone to just sleep with whatever it might be that's who they're going to pick from so i don't necessarily think it's like a hard and fast rule like i, I think it's reasonable that, that some of those people will pick them i will say though if you do that, it probably is worth keeping in mind that some people will judge you for that. And some mm. people, probably unfairly even, some people will think, you, actually, unfortunately, some people might think you're trying to sleep your way to the top. Like, for example, even though, like, an interviewer dating a pro player doesn't in a direct fashion boost their career, because indirectly it might, like it helps increase their profile, no. they might get more interviews that team. Some people will, unfortunately, unfairly assume you're trying to, like, Beast boosting career, whereas maybe that really is just someone you want to have a relationship with. So I think it's one of those, like, one of those where it's a bit more, there's like more nuance than initially appears. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Totally. My two cents is it's incredibly hard for people in esports to date people outside of esports due to the kind of time spent and also just like what you talk about. And it just makes you a weird person, you yeah. know, it's hard to relate to, right? Yeah, what you talk about. So I think it's very natural that pro players date other females in the esports scene. Uh, I definitely don't think it's morally correct nor like right wait a minute wait, not, no, no. Right wait, no, no. morally correct or right for people to serially date oh, like when enough. people are like 
I think it's perfectly fine to have a relationship, but if it's like relationship after relationship after relationship in very quick succession, then that's something like I'll have an eye on. Like, or like, what are you doing here? But if someone is having like a genuine long term relationship with a pro player or not even a pro player, anyone in, in esports as a female, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. The dating to the top, the thing that you brought up, I think that's definitely something fucked up, and you're definitely using people, especially. For esport pros who are very young and who've never had like relationships before, like I've seen so many cases of like girls in esports taking advantage of that and like serially dating like that. You know, though, it can also go the other way. Like this is the other part people don't think about. The flip side to the same question is when a pro player dates a fan, Mm -hmm. because I would in the same sense say on the one hand, I actually understand why pro players would do that. Aside from the angle on like a lot of them are very young and they might not have any game and that might be the only people they talk to. But on one level, they have an incredibly demanding job that a normal relationship will not work for. So actually you need someone who appreciates that your job's really important, like that you can't like have time off. So actually in terms of the people, again, you have to choose from, that's probably not a bad pool of people to choose from. The problem is this is what the downside is. So just as the girl could be judged unfairly by people in the industry, I often tell pro players this, this is what you have to know going into getting a girl who also knows gaming and is in your space is one day odds are she's not going to be your wife you're probably not going to have a 30 year relationship with her right so whenever you break up if she is also in the esports space Mm. there is a very serious possibility she did someone else in esports so even though you can't like you're you're gonna have no control over that that might fuck with you like if it's a teammate of yours or a rival of yours or you just see the person at parties again and again and again that might get to you so i would just say i wouldn't say don't do it as a result but at least know going in that that could happen because like i could see that putting pressure on people in a different way where they're young and naive so they don't think about it but you're looking at it look like my joke would be this like it's all well and good now thinking oh it's brilliant that my girlfriend knows about league of legends and she knows that she's mm-hmm. supporting my team that's not going to be as fun like when you come back next year and she's dating like Dorkler or something is it like it's, that's gonna hurt <laughs> it's gonna hurt you a little bit you're gonna be like oh, oh really oh no i thought thought i'd moved on dude i think it's gonna be like you when you see double lift five years later you still haven't moved on you haven't got over it you haven't resolved those feelings uh, i think pro gamers are very shitty boyfriends like they can't make time they're of course what is it so invested into the game like double s said it best like if to be the best pro like he said it in his like kind of the lead up to the finals like nothing comes before the championship nothing comes be- what is it between me and winning not family not relationship so generally i mean genuinely my question is why would you want to date a pro player um it makes for a shitty like when you hear about successful relationship like ambition and meng the um, they they got married. All their stories is about oh, ambition was so busy. Oh, he couldn't make time for me. Oh, I had to make so much sacrifice because of this. Oh, I had to take care of him because of this. Like, it's, I it they make for shitty boyfriends. Yeah, I agree. Listen, and again, that should be that would be really good advice to tell a girl who's considering dating an esports guy. Here's my counterpoint to that: mm-hmm. is let me know any other twenty year old kid who could just afford to like straight up floss you with like the Ugg boots, the fucking like sick car, like mm-hmm. a little Ford that he's gonna get you on the side there. All the latest fashion, like he's got you all the Yeezys, everything. Like normal twenty year old ain't gonna be able to do that. So again, you always make that decision. It's like the woman who marries the really successful businessman. He's not gonna be there, is he? But you're gonna be alone in a fucking baller ass house with a maid that comes and cleans all the ships like. so again what do you want in life that's the question isn't it well, that's the question i don't know i think most people would want fulfilling relationship over um what is it like <laughs> really good lcs that's- seats Oh. <laughs> no, come on. That's that's the bullshit part, though, local. That's exactly what I'm getting at, though. Is what I, this is the problem actually with how people analyze, especially if they're like a n- neutral third party, right? Mm-hmm. Is whenever you look at a situation, because you're watching it and you're not in the situation, so you're not having an emotional response, you're not like in the moment where you have to respond instantly, you get to sort of analyze and sit and think, what would I do? And what could I do after that? And you can plan the whole thing out. Mm-hmm. Everyone, when they do that, mate, is 10 times smarter. Like, we're all geniuses who know, like, oh, I would just have docked his punch and then tripped over and then punched him on the way. And they're like, they're saying, no one would do any of that in real life, would they? Like, so my point here is, right, people think that, like, well, we wouldn't have a fulfilling relationship. Like, no one thinks that in life, though. Like, you don't go, you don't, when you've never met a girl before and you just see her, you don't go, would I have a meaningful <laughs> relationship if I was to ask this girl? To go, no, you have to get her to just have a drink with you first, mate. Like, it's like step one. So it's like, you're weird. That's like putting the cart before the horse, mate. You've got to get to like five steps in before you decide there's going to be like serious relationships. So I can see how people make 
the first steps and then just get caught up with it and go along with it. And they don't think until it's too late, all these things. And, and usually, let's face it, you learn these things from hindsight. Don't you? you have to make the mistake and then you learn it. Mm. Right, Loco? You learn through experience, right? Exactly. Because mm -hmm. you have to realize, Loco, there's people out there. Look, this, e this even sometimes works, you know, Loco. Like, I'm not going to explain the circumstances, but one time I actually had a scenario where I, I was fortunate enough to make a connection with someone, right? And they were actually telling me all sorts of mad shit like that, like, oh, you know, I really shouldn't, uh, I don't think I should, I don't think I should go, should go for a drink with you. And I was like, oh, why is that then? They're like, oh, people told me, like, you know, when you were in Korea, you were just like sleeping with a lot of different women, you know, and, you're like, and, was, and I was like, listen, I'm not going to apologize for who I was, you know, but this is a different situation. And you could, what's mad is you could, this is why I'm saying you can't just give people advice because that is actually great advice, whoever gave them that advice. But the problem is they didn't know. That was like working for this person. They were getting into that shit. They were like, think that I was like unattainable or something. I was like, I'm very attainable right now. So listen, let's, let's make shit work. So. Oh my God. How you doing, Loco? <laughs> I'm doing great. How are you, Lisa? Right. How are you yeah, doing? I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. Thorin, does your reput uh, reputation precede you when you're like meeting people? Oh, that's a problem I actually have. <laughs> Here's the thing. It's, it, it's funny if it's like a scenario where, you know, you're meeting them and you're just having fun, you're bantering or whatever. That's yeah. good. The bad part is you wouldn't believe how many people are like really intimidated when they come and talk to me because I don't know why, but they actually, they don't know that like, they don't know what showmanship is basically. Mm -hmm. So they think, for example, this is real. I've had fans who actually came up to me and said like, oh, I was really nervous to ask you to take a picture because I thought maybe you'll just flame me. It's like, <laughs> why the fuck would I just flame like a random fan in the street? Like, no, like I do that when it's on camera because it's fun or, you know, like someone made a point. Like that's the downside is people actually probably take it too seriously and think I'm going to be like really intense or something. Whereas like in reality, it's true, I don't really like people, but I would be polite. <laughs> like, I actually believe in being polite in general. I think you should have manners, you know. I'm very British in that sense. Mm. Wow. Shocked. I'm shocked. I was so nervous going into this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I told you, it'd just be us flaming loco. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's I'm glad the, the flame one, is focusing right? on loco. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, exactly. Lisa, so yeah. I actually have a huge kind of problem with like you guys' the show Squad. Or uh, Can you explain your show a little and then I'll yeah, yeah, talk about sure. my problem with it. Oh, so you introduce it with you have a problem with it. Why don't I know. You know he's, he's, that's he great. That's why he's not getting interviews, doesn't he? He goes, I actually uh, hate the thing that you do for your job. But anyway, you, in, you introduce it and then I'll explain what's going on. It doesn't matter how I sell it now because yeah. you're going to have yeah, to on. Yeah. on it. All right. So Northern Arena, we started uh, a new... So Squad is actually like a brand name. And underneath the banner, we have multiple shows. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is um, cover esports and gaming, first of all. So for each day of the week, we have an hour show, or sorry, half an hour show dedicated to a specific esport. Mm -hmm. So we're doing League, we're doing FPS games, whether it's Counter-Strike or, you know, or Battle Royales, mm -hmm. Apex, Fortnite, whatever. So each day of the week, we have a new esport we focus on. We bring on players, bring on pros, casters, all that, break down the week of whatever happened. And then we have another show where we take, you know, topics that the gaming world in general are talking about, whether it's a new game release or drama on the internet between Loco and Double If. Like we bring that up and we talk about it. Mm -hmm. We kind of bring the news to the people. We talk about a debate. So it's like a more fun show. So what we are trying to do is cover a lot of esports, but also general gaming because those worlds kind of, you know, they're part of the same thing. Mm -hmm. And just, uh, yeah, create content that's entertaining, but also informative. So it is, It is. I know it's a very ambitious goal and we're very new. We just started in Jan March, actually. We launched in March. Mm -hmm. So. What's your issue with the show? Yeah, like, let's just pause there one second. So that sounded like a very reasonable project, you know, right? like, I understand like the, the marketing aspects behind it, even very good in terms of scheduling. Right, go on then, Loco, explain why you hate the show. <laughs> Squad State, by the way, you can okay. find us. Okay, cool. So I think <laughs> most games nowadays are like life consuming. When you play League of Legends or League of Legends is your game, that's pretty much the only game you play. You don't play other things. I think it really started with World of Warcraft, where if you play World of Warcraft, just World of Warcraft is your game. And also CSGO. To play CSGO and to like genuinely be able to enjoy CSGO, you have to put so much time into it. Like the movement for the game is very, very technical. Even how you shoot the gun is very, very technical. Like there's spray patterns that you have to learn. To even get to play CSGO with my friends, I had to invest so much time like learning little parts, like learning callouts. Like they'd be calling, oh, he's on cat, he's on cat. I'm like, where the fuck is cat? And they're like, how do you not know where cat is? Like it's right fucking there. Like everyone calls it cat. So all these games that are esports, it's very, very hard to be fans of multiple esports. And like, for me, someone who's my entire life is to be an esport expert and talk about esports and know esports, like 
it's so much to just even handle League of Legends. And when your show is catered to a bunch of different games, right? Like for the audience, like for majority of the time I'm bored and then it hits that one sweet spot where you're talking about a game that I like and I personally play and I can vibe with that. But yeah, I think it's kind of a myth on the audience where in traditional sports, if you watch football, you probably also watch basketball. Like the two major sports, like almost everyone watches. Like you're a general sports fan, but I don't think people in general are esports fans. They are League of Legends fans. They are CSGO fans. Sure. They are Overwatch fans. So I think there is like a huge myth in terms of what audience you could actually be mm-hmm. um, hitting. I think, I mean, I think that's fair. However, I also think that's kind of an old school way of thinking because you come from a perspective where, you know, you've invested so much time into one game. Whereas now, if you really look- To be look, fair, Loka, you aren't really their target audience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting to that point. So <laughs> the point is, yeah, of course, you know, certain people have their game that they're only going to focus on. But now if you really look at the, the market and the people mm-hmm. with ESPN coming in, with all the big markets coming in and a lot of, you know, these channels taking highlights from games, mm-hmm. it's opening up the pool where, yeah, you might be invested in League, <clears throat> but if all of a sudden you see a show or highlights about another game, you can follow it in a general way like you can pique your interest you know you can open your mind to different games Mm -hmm. you you yourself might only invest your time in league and you do your league shows and stuff but other people they like to hop from game to game you know Mm -hmm. like when apex came out a lot of people dropped fortnite played apex tried it loved it they are staying with it or they dropped it went back to fortnite like the thing with video games is that there's always a new game out and so you kind of have to as a show or as content i think you have to kind of not narrow yourself or put yourself in a box or (coughs) So you kind of have to take it two ways, whether you select a game and focus your market on that, but that game is only going to have a certain amount of numbers, right? Like how many people watch that? But if you really want to cast a wider net, which I think the trend is going to go towards, right? With ESPN coming in, with other channels coming in, they're going to feature a bunch of different games. You kind of have to also be in that space and be open to creating content about other things. And we're not here to try to take, you know, a viewer and convert them to a certain game. We're just like, we're making content for all viewers. You can come in and join us. You can watch what you want. You can leave. Like, we're not here to (laughs) trap you into this game or convert you. That's not what it is. It's just, we're creating something for everyone. Pick the slice you want and take it and go. You know, that's kind of, I guess, more of our mentality. And I think in down the line, that's where, you know, being a channel that has multiple games in it, that's where people can just tune in, watch. It's like watching Netflix. Sometimes you put on a show, you don't really pay attention, but you're doing other stuff, you know? That's the kind of space we want to create for gamers, not just a person who likes League or a person who likes CSGO. Yeah. See, the so, joke there would be when you said, sometimes you watch Netflix and doing other things. Everyone else is going to think you were implying like Netflix oh, and shit. I imagine for local. You guys me, can do whatever you want to squad. Local, local. <laughs> I think Loco actually hates the phrase Netflix and chill because you know what? The first 10 times he tried to watch Netflix and chill, he just watched 10 full movies. Aww, see, see the joke there? See the joke? See, I didn't Aww. Know. <laughs> Aww, <laughs> now it's just sad. You didn't really want to watch Harry Potter all over again. It's the irony there is, of course. I love Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Of course you do. <laughs> Are you the sort of person, local? Just admit it. If it's true, just admit it. It's going to be funnier, right? Are you the sort of person who actually thinks like the house that you identify with in Harry Potter like is very telling about who you are as a person? Yeah, I'm a Slytherin. <gasps> what is wrong? wrong? I know you are. You're a TSM member. You little cunt. <laughs> Why? What's wrong with being a Slytherin? I think there are certain houses in Harry Potter that are very like. Well, wasn't telling. technically Harry Potter supposed to be Slytherin, but like yeah. the hat or something. No, no, he chose Harry, he chose Gryffindor, and like, right, okay. you can choose what house you are in. Like, if you truly want to be in a house, like you can choose a house, and that is like okay. part of being in Harry. I do think Harry Potter houses are very good personality tests. <laughs> yeah. I get a lot. What Harry Potter house would you be in, Lisa? Okay, I did take the Pottermore t- uh, Pottermore test, the quiz. Mm. I was in Ravenclaw. Mm. <laughs> was that mm. a good one? I, I think Do you actually not watch Harry Potter, Thor? I don't know, the... Ravenclaw, I don't know. okay, Ravenclaw. You're from the UK. Wasn't that like a religion there? No. <laughs> yeah, but I hate, I hate kids' books. So Ravenclaw is no, it's young, young adult. Ravenclaw is about intelligence. <laughs> it's about it's about wit, and then Slytherin is about like that sounds like my house. Then yeah, I'd be in that one. Slytherin sure, is about sure. no no cunning and passion and what is it getting what you want at whatever cost. Gryffindor is about bravery. Gryffindor is about doing just things like fighting for what you think is right. Hufflepuff. No, that's for plebs. That one's for plebs. <laughs> no, one, no one wants to be in that one. No. Yeah, what, what are the other ones? Hufflepuff is the ultimate pleb house. Hufflepuff is like, 
you value loyalty you value working with others like teamwork like the it's nice, that the yeah guys. the nice guys it's the actual like cloud nine yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very much like cloud nine and the joke is like this is the house that like food and then like this is the house where all the stoners are at so it is very much cloud nine <laughs> exactly damn mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyways, Doran, what was your opinion on kind of my criticism, at least this show, that most fan bases are very dedicated <coughs> towards one game, not towards multiple games? Right, the thing with that is, like, the, there's, a, there's an interesting way to answer it because it depends on the distribution method. Because on the one hand, I would agree with you. Like, I actually think a flaw that has happened the last five years in esports is, think about the number of companies who came in and said, we're trying to be the ESPN of esports. And as soon as you hear that line, it's like death immediately. You know, mm -hmm. that company's going to die out. Like, like, cause by the way, even ESPN hasn't become the ESPN of esports. Like no <laughs> one's done it. Like, mm -hmm. and not least because if you look in the traditional media, that type of media in normal media is sort of dying away. Like ESPN isn't, I hate to break it to you guys. ESPN isn't doing that well in real sports. Like they're having problems with subscribers and the monetization aspect. So everyone in digital media is suffering anyway. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, I sort of agree. Like it is hard to capture like a wide audience there's not as many people play like five games but here's the way i think you can make it work is when i watch some of those shows like here's the thing i don't watch on television like skip bayless and shannon and all i just watch the clips on the internet mm -hmm. well the good thing about the clips on the internet is they cut them all down to each section don't they mm -hmm. so if, I, if there's a clip that is like oh what do you think about russell westbrook mm -hmm. yeah i might click that one and watch it but maybe I wouldn't click the other NBA one and watch it. Or maybe I only loosely care about like boxing or something. But if that one clip was really interesting, I might click that. So I think as long as you like parcel it up and you make it possible to like kind of pick a la carte, like I want this one and this one, but I'll skip that one. That's actually a way you can make it work, I think. So I think it depends on the distribution as to whether it could work. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what we do with our show Unmuted because we talk about so many things, whether it's news or we literally can take something a pro has said and we react to it. The Hungry Box getting like a crab thrown at him recently. I don't know if you guys heard about that one. Oh, yes. Like we literally took that clip, you know, told the story, reacted to it. We can take that, package it and send it out. And people can just also share the reaction, right? We just want to facilitate discussion, which I think mm -hmm. that's basically what Reddit is, but we're just kind of making it into a show format. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think- The irony being though, that you actually couldn't figure out how to unmute yourself most of the time during this show. So most of the time okay. you were so. Um, that <laughs> is... Worked into the theme, but you know. <laughs> Like I eventually ended it myself. Yeah. I yeah, eventually exactly. figured it out. So there you go. That was all promotion. That was a plan. Oh, right. <laughs> let me let me say something on that part. I think the distance between fans and esports, fans and pro players and esports being paper thin is a really great thing for esports and really great thing for fan interaction. But I think there is like a tragedy looming. Esports is getting oh, way gosh. too big, and security is not tight enough. I. I don't want to be like a Debbie Downer and I don't want to be like a person like saying like something bad is going to happen. But I do feel like something bad is going to happen, like something terrible is going to happen. And then the security will go up. And I feel like security I mean, needs to go up before that. Bad we've already had happens. bad things happen mm -hmm. at esports events. Just the first one comes to my mind, the Madden event that happened, I think last yes. year, a player got shot. Like it is becoming a big issue. And actually with League, you know how Korea did that whole separation booth thing? Mm -hmm. And now, or did they bring back the non-booth thing? Yeah, it's non-booth or... right now. It's not booth. Why, 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 why uh, do they keep switching back and forth? It's, I mean, Riot, it's almost all Riot tournaments are like that now. Like where it's in like a square, you play in a square and there's four screens around you and then you're mm -hmm. facing your opponent. I know LCS and EU LCS or LEC isn't like that but all international events are like that. And when they built Law Park, the newest Riot Stadium, it was designed like that. So that's what Riot wanted. <coughs> mm. But that's just a side note. Uh, but yeah, it seems like there is an increasing need for it. And I, I don't know, I think the player, the audience kind of understands if life is really being threatened here, they're not going to, I'm, I'm for me, I'm a very reasonable person, obviously. So I'm like, mm. I don't think it's a big deal, but maybe for someone who's followed for so long, you know, they're gonna be upset with that. Mm. I don't know. At League, at the NALCS studio, you can actually, after games, like, handshake with them all, right? Like, that's a thing they always do. Mm -hmm. Do you think in the future they're going to remove that? Is that what you're worried about? Well, so one thing that happened was, like, during, like, the handshake, right? So it's an infamous incident where Afro went for a handshake, and someone went and twisted his nipple as he's going for a handshake. That's sexual harassment. That is fucked up. There's one almost as bad as that in CSGO, which is a very... Is it the dildo? Thing. 
when at one of the majors in CSGO local, mm-hmm. we used to, because it would be in a stadium, what they would do to make it really hype is when the match was happening, a playoff match, both teams would walk through the crowd, kind of mm-hmm. like a UFC fight, you know, you know, walk out, you do this, like you get everyone's hands. And when Olaf Meister, who at the time, by the way, was the best player in the world, was walking out and he went like this down the line, someone just in the line slapped his hand with a massive dildo. <laughs> like that. And this is all on camera, like, and everyone's like, well, reasonable. <laughs> think, at least, you know how at least that was funny, though. Did you uh, talk to him about that? Luckily, he has like an all right sense of humor. So he wasn't like yeah. super bothered. And by the way, CS GoPros from back in the day when CS was way smaller as an eSport, like they're, they're not really going to get like rattled by that sort of thing. So that's not as big a deal. But I agree. Like the, like, the, the Afro move one's ridiculous. Like under no yeah. circumstances should anyone be touching you like that. Even if it's just as a joke, like just don't do it. Like mm-hmm. that that is out of control. The problem mm-hmm. with that, by the way, is... Obviously, like I said, in the UFC, they walk along. You know, when people could touch them. The difference is, at the UFC, people understand if you reached over and do some guy's nipple, there's a security guy there will just literally pull you out that, like some ex-linebacker guy from college football will just grab you out of that stadium yeah. and you'll be chucked the fuck out of the stadium instantly. So once people understand that precedent, I think it'll get fixed. Because here's the thing, even though I agree with you, local, there definitely is a lot of room where we're just lucky that no one has done anything really fucked up yet. Mm-hmm. It could have happened. To be fair... A lot of that does happen anyway in like traditional sporting events. Like I often think about like the maddest one ever, dude, is I like I like the sport tennis, right? Mm. And in tennis, it's actually a sport that the crowd can ruin the actual game easier than any sport in the world. Because if you're going to serve and someone shouts, it'll put you off. Like if you're just about to hit the ball and someone goes, hey, you'll you'll what the fuck? Right. And then you'll you'll do it right. So as a result. In theory, anyone in the crowd at any moment could just ruin the game. Mm-hmm. But the reason it doesn't happen is because of what I just said there. Like people know if you shout something out, someone will spot you and people will say it was him mm-hmm. and they will literally boot you out and you might even get like a lifetime ban or something. Mm-hmm. So you, you kind of like have to have a precedent set really that people know also what happens if you do something really stupid like that. Okay, so I, well, my example was more so, let's say, what if it, I wanted to like physically like touch Kevin Durant on the shoulder, like sure. literally impossible for me. I would have to get- I mean, if you caught side, you could maybe do it. Yeah, know? so I would need court side tickets and I would need to like rush up as like he's playing, right? So sure. if I wanted to tap Bjergsen on the shoulder or like touch Bjergsen on the shoulder, the most famous player in our game, or at least in LCS or double if whatever, we don't have to have the GOAT discussion right now. But <laughs> if I wanted to tap Bjergsen or double lift, very easily doable, like to just physically touch. And if I could be doing it with ill intent, like someone with ill intent sure. could do serious damage like that. And the fact that fan interaction is so possible and so readily available is a great thing. And also, I feel like a horrible thing waiting to happen. There has to be more vetting. There has to be better security around it. I mean, as we see esports go big, go bigger and bigger, as media too, we, we're starting to feel, I think, a distance more, right? With, for example, Overwatch League, I've personally felt that it's been really hard to get con- like contacts with the players and the casters. Because with, when you want to interview a caster from Overwatch League, you actually have to go through their PR. You cannot directly message them. Uh, if you do, they tell you to talk to PR. PR has to reply, has to set it up and everything. Same with players. They go, talk to my PR. Like, now, in eSports, it's a whole, talk to PR, talk to PR, talk to my agent. Mm-hmm. And that's become, that's a growing distance that's happening now that eSports is getting so big. On one hand, it's great for the players, you know, having agents, all that stuff, protection. But at the same time, for media, it's getting harder and harder. And I don't know. I don't know if we're ready for that challenge. But at the same time, it's kind of something we have to accept as eSports grows bigger. We're going to have to go around those, I guess, obstacles. Mm -hmm. And I know with NALCS, the big thing was that before they used to give interviews at finals, right? Like Mm -hmm. with individual players. The last couple of seasons now, it's press conference only. Unless you're one of the big top three or whatever. But basically, it's all press conference. So it's not worth it anymore to go to these events to get a presser that everyone's literally going to just put that content out out anyways. Mm -hmm. So there is a growing distance between players and media, teams and media. Mm -hmm. And... I don't know. That's kind of daunting as a content creator, you know, to sure. think about. But down the line, that just shows maybe pros, con- like content around pros is not the way to go anymore. Mm-hmm. It's now about building your own personal brand yeah. analysis like you guys have done, right? Like that is just, we got to expand our world. It's not just about players anymore. It's about the universe, right? The world of gaming. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of something the squad has already like considered. We're doing not just pro player stuff. We're doing just entertainment and lifestyle and all that stuff because that's basically the world we're now living in esports it's a lifestyle it's not just sport yeah to survive as media i feel like you have to have your own brand or it's impossible to survive and the media without their own brand like isn't that relevant doesn't get hits like 
I feel like someone like Emily Rand and someone like Kelsey, they write great pieces. Their pieces are um, very articulate. They know a lot about the game. They're very legitimate. But those aren't the people getting the most hits, even when they are working for like media outlets like ESPN. So <laughs> your own brand is super important. And how you portray yourself and how much fan base you have, how much influence you command is huge right now for media. Well, that's also because like another element, like for ex the example you gave there, like one of the problems in that particular example is like, I wouldn't describe those people as like fabulously charismatic or very entertaining. And the problem is those are the, actually the, like if I had to pick skills, which would be the best to succeed in, I'd actually pick those rather than knowing about the game. Like if you're entertaining or when you speak, it's compelling or there's something about like, just the way you speak it's charismatic people are drawn to you they want to hear what you have to say next you haven't even said anything yet and it's it's the people are in they've bought in the problem is if you go the route of like i just know everything about the game that's also the only level people can engage with you on like mm -hmm. either they right. know as much about you or they're judging you like well, was it this good it's the same thing with the example of being a coach local like i actually made this point to you on a past episode i think it's a real point though it's like if you try and battle a player like i i'm your coach and i know the most about the game you can be, you might be able to win. Like maybe you make a point and the player's like, actually, yeah, you're right. I was wrong about mm -hmm. that. But if you, if he now thinks he beat you on that point, like he made a better point, mm -hmm. you now have no leg to stand on because you made your whole thing about you know more than him. Yeah. Whereas if instead you were like, I'm just the, I am the authority figure and I'd like to discuss this with you, but we can have a discussion, you know, and either way, like my job's to do more things than just know everything about the game. Now you've got like a position that's like, they can't like assault that basically. So it's a tough one because I do agree. Like those are people obviously I've tried to help many times in the past. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's not, it's like, here's the thing, they have their own niche, but the problem is you're right, they're not gonna be number one unless they can add some of those other elements. Like actually, I would say, I, I mentioned it earlier on, I would actually say that's an area where Lisa actually has, seems to have a strength over many people in esports. Like if she did an interview with Bjergsen, She's not going to ask him about like super in-depth stuff in the draft or what he did in a 1v1 matchup. But I bet she could get some more interesting questions than someone who had no personality and asked those amazing questions about the topic. It might be a more interesting interview. Mm -hmm. Loco, I'll teach you some things. Don't worry. <laughs> sure, <Okay. Lisa>. sure, <laughs> sure. I don't know. Yeah. There, there's always been that debate whether it's easier to learn journalism skills or personable skills or the hardcore like analysis part, right? I can probably read a book. I can watch videos. I can learn about the game. But you can also practice the personable skills. But which sure. one is kind of harder to get, you know? I don't know. There's I was kinda... naturally gifted with both, so I never really had to put work into either. Oh, fuck you guys. Oh, my God. I hate this silence. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to say you don't have any skills, but, you know. Oh, my God. That silence I can't, lasted I can't, I can't fucking... be complicit in a lie. So... Oh, my God. That yeah. silence lasted five minutes in my Oh, my fucking God. That was just... <laughs> Oh, that was uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, we didn't even script that. <laughs> that is one thing, though, Loco, that is actually weird. Actually, I'll just bring this up then. Because when you do your interviews, yeah. bizarrely, when you do your interviews, you actually, yourself, I think, go too, too kind of dry, actually. You just go really? way too much into the game. Like, oh, what did we think of the draft? That's mm -hmm. like, you actually should put a bit more of your personality into it, I think. Uh -huh. Well, I always felt like I wanted, I wanted my brand to be analytical and more right. player focused and hard hitting like that was my biggest but i'll also okay. add the entertainment part that's a good call i just think it's a, like it's like you, if you can do both mm -hmm. why limit yeah. yourself to one right okay okay all right <clears throat> Dorian, we're nearing the end of the episode do you want to talk about the flame that you yes i do yet? so here's the premise right you might not know this lisa but <clears throat> for the finals of the lcs um me and loco had a bet right that he, he picked TSM to win. I picked Team Liquid to win. And then whoever lost the bet, right, the idea was the loser had to make a video about the one who won and how they're brilliant, right? So it <laughs> turns out, this is a side topic, it turns out during the actual final when Local was watching it, were you on stream at the time? Yeah. Right, he was watching the finals on stream. And since TSM went up 2-0 and he thought, like, oh, there's no way Team Liquid comes back, he also then said, you know what? If Team Liquid does come back, I'll also make a video about Double Lift and why he's the greatest player. So the problem is, obviously, Team Liquid did come back and they did win the finals. So Loco made a video, right? First of all, the video is only like 10 minutes long. But I was thinking, oh, that might be okay. Maybe, you know, in 10 minutes, he got through a lot. If it's a 10 minute video, obviously I'm using like loose like description here. I don't know exactly the running time, mm -hmm. but if it was a 10 minute video, the first three minutes of him just explaining the premise and how he doesn't really think the double is the goal. And he's not, he 
doesn't really want to do the video. The last two minutes of him explaining, like, well, anyway, that's the end of this video, and it wasn't that good. And there's, like, barely anything in the video. There's maybe, like, three minutes in the middle where all he does is say, like, Double Lift is really good, then spend a solid half of this time downplaying him, saying, like, he's not even that talented, though. Like, there's a lot of people have as much talent as him. He's not even that talented. Guys, mm -hmm. he's not that talented. And then just at the end sort of goes, but he is really good because he worked hard. <laughs> anyway, that's enough of that. That's enough of the video. Well, it's like, you never went into why he was great. You never made a single case why he was the greatest. You never explained all the great things about his career. Thirdly, fuck you. He's mega talented. Way more talented <laughs> than you ever were in any area in your life. He definitely is a talented well, I don't even know what you're talking about. So anyway, come on, then. Come on. I think why I don't... Really really talk highly about double lift talent double lift definitely is talented don't get no no wait a second, wait a second. we'll get into that in a second why did you make a bullshit video why didn't you just do it properly <clears throat> okay, you I'll... mailed that motherfucker in you formed that I'll, I'll i'll spend more effort and do it better next time or i'll even redo that video but my point about double lift and his talent what i don't think double lift is that incredibly talented i think there are <sighs> several players annoyed. of double lift talent we can no, because here's the problem, right? Mm -hmm. When you first said this, look, I actually thought, oh, I know why people have took the wrong angle. Because what you first said was, you said, mm -hmm. oh, there's plenty of people had double of talent, right? Mm -hmm. Then you listed initially, you listed a bunch of Asian players. Like, you know, you were like Prey, mm -hmm. Uzi, I, like, that's fine. I agree with you. If you talk mm -hmm. about the best players ever, yeah, there were some very, very mm -hmm. good Asian players. The problem is you also then looked back in and were like, even for NA, he's not like that talent. There's some mad comment like that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me explain what I believe <coughs> talent is. Talent is natural aptitude for the game that sure. has nothing to do with effort let's say like your sure. reaction time your aptitude for learning your aptitude for problem solving for pattern okay. recognition so your aptitude for to be good at the game without any kind of effort put in it might be effort that you put in when you were younger or like your parents made you take classes that made you better at this but just you as a player like how good you can be at the game like <coughs> that's what i view talent as nothing that has to do with effort I think there are a lot of p players, even in NA, with the same level of talent as Doublelift, or even better. And I don't say that as a diss at Doublelift, because what Doublelift is so incredibly good at is his dedication and the amount of work he puts into practice, and how good he wants to be, and how focused he is on League of Legends, and how he, he sacrifices other aspects of his life. Like, that's what makes Doublelift special. It's not how well he clicks around. It's not how... Like, it's, it has nothing to do with his natural talent. It has to do with his dedication for the game. Okay. So it's if kind I of had to pick, Loco, if mm. I had to pick someone who, uh, like, if I made a top 10 list, top mm. 10 most talented players from Western League of Legends, Double Lift is definitely on this list, mate. Like, this guy is absurdly good mechanically. Mm -hmm. Even when he was a brand new player and had no game sense whatsoever, mm -hmm. he was already, like, mechanically as good as the best players in the entire world in League of Legends. Like, the idea you're going... I don't know why this is the hill you're going to mm -hmm. die on. Like, Double Lift isn't that mechanically... Are you your mind? Like, it's one of well, the best but, players ever in that but, respect. But if it's not even someone who okay. practices that much. Like, you, you're always no, crying double, about how... Double they, you're always crying mm -hmm. about how you, your team didn't get into LCS because he beat you on Team Liquid. Mm -hmm. He wasn't even playing. He was a streamer who just literally picked the game back up again, busted your whole team's ass out in a land <laughs> best of five, and then just cruised back to TSM. No, he I wasn't even playing. I disagree with that. I do, I disagree with the fact that Double Lift isn't playing that much or Double Lift doesn't put work into the game. I think in terms of pure actual work put into the game, the two most people that do it in NA are Double and Bjerg. No way. Who do you, no who do you think had entire years where he didn't used to put in that much solo? Who do you time? think puts in more work than Double or Bjerg? Like in across LCS. Can you name oh, me a few? Just any LCS we're yeah. talking about? I bet there's loads of players. Oh, could you name some? I don't know them all personally. Like, mm -hmm. NA is not my region, mate, but Bjergsen would obviously be one. I would guess a bunch of the European imports to Koreans, obviously, I would assume grind solo queue pretty hard. The problem here is you're taking the end of his mm -hmm. career when he's a professional. The first half of Double's career was raw as fuck. In mm -hmm. CLG, they were playing like Mortal Kombat 3 and then going <laughs> and playing like LCS games with no scrims. Like, <laughs> They were still the, really good even the, then. Those days were bad, and people mentioned Zaben as someone that puts in a lot of work. So, where on that end, I will admit, like Double Lift does do better than Zaben with less amount of practice. From what I've seen, like all Zaben does is play solo queue, and all Zaben does is think about League of Legends and play League of Legends. But in terms of talent, I don't think Double Lift is like that's not the most special part of Double Lift. I think the most special part of Double Lift is his dedication to the game, like day in, day out, and also the consistency and how long he's been able to have that dedication. I mean, you're welcome to be wrong. That's mm -hmm. always a, a factor of this show. You're allowed to have an entirely wrong opinion, mm -hmm. uh, be absolute trash at articulating it, say something everyone thinks is stupid, and at the end, we all just go, well, 
you can't change your local and then we move on with our lives so wait you don't think if dedication like you think if dedication and the effort is greater than his talent like i think one? this mm -hmm. like i think the old cliche that everyone always says like hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard is true but mm -hmm. the point is double if to someone who has both mm -hmm. that's why he's the best mate he now is here's the problem mm -hmm. though is the, the, this is why I think you're underselling it is he could have been someone who half-assed it and just mm -hmm. did like the bare minimum and he would still be a very good player by the way he would still probably be a top 10 NA player mm -hmm. so how you think he's not doing that off talent I don't know but whatever you've, you're just you're doing a Weldon Green and just defining talent differently mm -hmm. I think there are people of double lift talent I, I look at someone like Afro I'm like oh Afro is talented but he doesn't have double lift dedication I look at Stixie I'm like oh Stixie had like Wait really? a minute. You, no, that's it. That's it. You've mm. nailed it. I forgot it. Mm. In the video, he actually dared to imply Stixir was... It? Everyone in the chat right now, mm. he implied Stixir was his talent in his double lift. Now, Mechanically. I don't, mm. No I, way. In no similar, universe. Similar, in no level, universe. similar levels of talent. Not I think. even vaguely. Not even vaguely close. To be fair, Aphromoo has said many times that Stixir was very similar to double lift in mechanically. Like... Afromu also thought that who he should join 100 Thieves as a middle oh! So listen, we all have a lot of opinions that aren't always good. So thanks for the alley hoop on that one. But, okay. you know. Oh my god. <laughs> all right, I, we can, all right. It seems like I didn't do the video justice. Also, Thorin, I released your video today, so you should go check it out after. And okay. if I oh, did This is great. It's probably like four minutes long. Like, <laughs> Thorin is an asshole. He is. He is an asshole. But I guess he did all right. Anyway, that's the end of the video. Is this the end? Did, do I get paid yet? So, oh, right. <laughs> Loco, where's my bet. video? Okay, you didn't win a bet. You didn't win a bet. So, okay, we'll make a bet like, next uh, season, boys. Yeah, let's go. go. <laughs> so I will, I will redo double lift video, and if you're not satisfied with yours, I'll do your video again too, and I'll put way more effort into it. Okay. Okay. All right. Just saying, put some effort in. Don't be, uh, a, stop being so vulnerable where you're like, oh, I can't. If I try, then people will judge me. It's like, yeah, people will judge you, but you know what? Just put yourself out there, local. I put myself out there all the time on this show. Uh, I'm not afraid of That's being flamed. Anyways. Final topic before we go. So I'm just saying though, if I ever come to LA and I open Tinder and I see like th that they have, you know, Facebook, uh, you have to log in using yeah. it. If I see that you're like a match to them, I'm swiping no. <laughs> <laughs> just saying, if I see you're connected in any way, I'm swiping no. Okay. I'm just not going to contaminate the, the, the pool in that sense, you know. You okay. have to stay in your area, I'm afraid. So the other topic that I want to hit on is um, do you guys know who TF Blade is? Yes. Vaguely streamer? Yeah, TF Blade is a streamer. He's one of the best players in North America in terms of solo queue. He's constantly hitting rank one. He plays a lot of the top lane carries. Um, he is a streamer for Team Liquid. So recently, he got banned from Twitch for 30 days because supposedly he said the N word on stream. And if you go back and listen to it, I think he says idiot. I'm not going to say whether he said idiot or N word because, I mean, Twitch doesn't agree that he said the um he said idiot twitch still thinks he said the m word but tf blade appealed and he told twitch like what the fuck i didn't say the n word i said idiot you can clearly hear i said idiot and twitch replied to them being like okay we still think you said the n word after listening through the video and listening through the clip we still think you said the n word but because we don't think you are hateful and because this is your first offense and you've never ever had anything like this we're gonna give your, we're gonna reduce your ban from 30 days to seven days. And then a lot of the streamers in, were in uproar about it, even Steve. So, cause he's on Team Liquid, Steve said, I listened to the video 20 times. He says, idiot. I'm gonna talk to Twitch about this and hopefully figure out this misunderstanding. Where I actually thought it was a really big deal that Steve spoke up is Liquid and Twitch are very closely intertwined. Um, they are in a partnership where Twitch exclusively sells sponsorships for Team Liquid. So they're very, very closely aligned. So Steve going out of his way to kind of challenge Twitch on that, I also think is a big deal. So that's kind of the issue at hand. What's your guys' take? Uh, on one hand, this is Twitch's platform. They can do whatever, whatever they want with it. On the other hand, if they, it has to, it, it comes with humility, I think. Like if they realize they are wrong, they can just say they're wrong. They should say they're wrong and just, you know, turn over, turn it over. Um, I don't think this is a really, <clears throat> I haven't seen the clip myself, so I can't really, you know, say whether he did or not. Steve stepping in is great that he's defending his own players. You know, Steve has always been one of the best owners, esports team owners. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's great. Twitch, uh, uh, I, have, I need to see the video. I actually mm -hmm. don't know. Thorin? 
here's the problem with this is like I'll be I'm actually probably going to be the only person who gives this particular opinion but you know that fa- there was two famous cultural incidents people will know when I refer to now so you remember the one where that girl had a dress on and you either thought the dress was like black and gold <laughs> or like blue and some other color yeah, and, for, yeah. and for people who don't know you remember famously everyone just like argued and then there was a uh, there was a sound clip where someone said yandy or they said some other word as well mm. same thing basically what these were actually phenomenon of is it actually depends on like the circumstances how you perceive something so i think you might have seen this online there's a there's a gift someone made mm. to show why the thing happened with the dress where they take a section of the collar dress here mm-hmm. and they move it to a different lighting and basically if you have like different like if you're slightly colorblind or whatever, then in, on this other lighting, it suddenly becomes like this works for my eyes. It goes from being like black or whatever to whatever the other color is. If you put it over a slightly different shade, like it transforms what your eye sees. Well, basically the same phenomenon, I, as far as I can tell, happened with this clip. Because when I first saw the clip was before I heard all the drama. I just saw someone saying he was banned. I clicked the clip. And you know what? I actually at first did think he said the N word. Like I actually was like, holy shit. Like, what? Did he really say that? Like, but then when I looked and he said that he said idiots, and then I listened with idiots in my mind, I was like, oh, he definitely says idiots. Like, all of a sudden it changed. And so I would just say, like, it's just like on the, the problem with it is, if you view it with like no context whatsoever, I could see someone going either way, mm-hmm. like come with one way or the other. So my problem with the whole scenario is this, is like, since I don't think it's clear that he said the N-word, and also the context doesn't make it seem likely that he did. Like, he didn't seem like he was super angry or whatever. He wasn't, like, flaming. He also is not someone with a track record of any sort of behavior. So, like, I don't... Like, in that scenario, I, I think if you're, like, the judge, you're the person who's overseeing what happens, you should give the person the benefit of the doubt. You should be like, well, I, I don't... You know, in this scenario, it's not really conclusive he did do it. If they're saying they didn't and it seems reasonable... We'll just say on this case, like, okay, be careful with that in the future, but, you know, we'll just give you a mm-hmm. warning or something. Like, my problem was more the angle on you said, you local, which is mm-hmm. if they really do know they fucked up, you've got to admit it at that point. What? You've got to say it for the sake of the community. You can't, like, punish the guy if you know he's mm-hmm. innocent. So, mm-hmm. like, I can't, on that one, I'm kind of torn because I think it was, like, debatable. But I will say once people said, no, no, he's saying idiots, then it did seem very clear after that. But I think it's trickier than people make out. So he says idiots a lot on stream and he never says the N word. So he's always like, oh, idiot this, okay. idiot that, idiot this. So it's not in his vocab to say the N word, first of all. So I. Well, that's what he probably should have done, by the way. This is what I would suggest then. I- I'm surprised he hasn't thought to do this. Get a bunch of clips of him saying idiots and then put him saying that after and see if it's similar. Mm-hmm. So there, he always says idiot. So I don't think N word is in his vocab. So I don't think he said the N word. And also a uh, big problem I have with this is say he did say the N word, right? Say. I'm not saying he did, but on KSA, he did say the N-word. Why is Twitch reducing the ban period from 30 days to 7? If he truly, genuinely did say the N-word, then he should get banned and treated like he said the N-word. If he didn't yes, say the right, N-word, actually. it should be zero. Yeah. It should either be you get punished like you said the N-word. Yes, that does make sense. Or you yeah. don't get punished because you didn't say the N-word. So That's true. W- what is going on? Like, Twitch, <laughs> you thought he said the N-word and now you're backpedaling. Oh, he really didn't say the N-word. But we also don't want to kind of apologize, so we're just gonna kind of like, we're gonna give you a light tap. So it is, it is what the fuck kind of situation. And these like mega corporations like Twitch, which is also owned by Amazon and like Google, Riot. Sometimes they can do no wrong, even when they're in the wrong, they can do sure. no wrong. Like what what can TF Blade do? Uh, people are like, he should sue Twitch. I'm like, are you <laughs> fucking? Are you are you fucking with me? First of all, TOS terms of service. Second of all, like like where does he start like how much money is it going to cost and like i'll take you like, 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 money. Yeah, exactly, this, yeah. that is not a real solution like tf blade has no play he has no play community outroar is his only play and it is happening steve is getting involved so in a sense team liquid is getting involved True. i'm very curious to see where this ends well that's, that's the thing that is worrying is like what would someone do if they were a small stream and they didn't have all these connections? Like they basically just be oh shit crazy. Yeah. Like they would just probably get the full ban. They'd have to serve it out. They wouldn't be able to complain because no one would care, and they'd just they'd just be wrecked. So I think he's actually lucky that he's in the position where there were people in the community who would speak out on his behalf. You know, mm-hmm. I would say this though. That's another area where I can add like another layer of subtlety, which is mm-hmm. for people who don't know. I'll give you an example everyone's aware of now. So you know, like last year, I think it was last year was when PewDiePie, like the number one YouTube. Guy, I kept getting in trouble over and over again with all these hit pieces saying he was mm-hmm. like 
part of the alt-right or that he supports Nazis or whatever because he made some like stupid joke on his stream. The problem with that, right, is the real reason why YouTube then clamped down on all the YouTube stuff is because PewDiePie isn't YouTube's customer. He's it's just someone the they benefit from. Yeah, the advertiser is. So the problem is what they were doing when they did the adpocalypse thing where they like reduced all the ads to certain videos was they were sending a message to their real customer, the, the people buying the ads, like we'll be very, very safe with this. Like if it's even possible that it's dodgy, we'll remove it immediately. So even though I wouldn't agree with that, I can see why they do it for business reasons. So unfortunately, it's the same thing with Twitch. Mm -hmm. If Twitch thinks there's even like a 20% chance he said that, they don't want the ad guy to be like, what? And then you unbanned him. So even though I personally disagree and I think that's fucked up, I know, I, I know like from a cynical business reason why they might think that that's the right move to do. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Mm. Yeah. But what? then they should just ban him. <laughs> I, if they, <laughs> probably, if they if genuinely they really think he said the yeah. N-word, then ban him. Then yeah. you set a precedent. People saying the N-word. doesn't make sense. Yeah. People saying the N-word get seven day bans because it hasn't been consistent also. Like there is people in the past that have said the N-word, got their entire channel wiped, got way longer banned than 30 days. So like this is, <laughs> I, it's, Twitch put them in a really, put themselves in a really shitty situation by first um, banning him and then also kind of appealing the ban to seven days. There the is part I found worrying though, Loco, is like all of that would be fine if everything we just said was the end of the story. But if you if you saw TF Blade posted the response he'd gotten from Twitch, right? Mm -hmm. And the part that was really worrying is quite early on in this response from the Twitch admin guy or whatever, he says like, you know, we had like our team review the video like 20 times and we all heard that end word. It's like, what? Like that's the part that's worrying because that makes me worried by the way. I won't go into a whole diatribe se separately about this, but there are a lot of people who are in positions of power in companies like that who have their own political agenda to push. And so unfortunately, if there's a person who's on that staff who just wants people to have said that and they want to ban as many like racists as possible, like that's also not a good look for their staff. You should have people on the staff, like I said. Mm -hmm. Like the person I want on the staff is like, you know the famous Bible story of King Solomon? I don't know if you're aware of this, look. I know like Christianity is not like a huge thing for... I, know, I lived in Korean. Texas. I was yeah. very Christian sure. during that time. Well, do you know the story of King Solomon? Mm -hmm. Basically, it's a famous story where these two women came to him, and one of the, and what oh, happened? Oh, they, they killed a child. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember what happened that. was yeah. one of the one. Of, what happened? Yeah. A woman had had a child, mm -hmm. and another woman stole the child. Yeah. And so they bring them before King Solomon, and they say to King Solomon, like, "Well, how do we solve this? You know, like." And he asks them both, like, "Well, is it your child? <laughs> yes. Is it your child? Yes." And so what he does is. Like, this is a Bible story, so it doesn't have to be a real thing, obviously. Like, as a, as a parable to teach people the concept of being a judge, he, he figures out, like, really cleverly, like, well, wait a minute. If only one of these women is the real mother of the child, what I need to do is do some sort of test that would show who is it more likely is the mother of the child. So what he says is, right, well, since you both claim that you're the mother of the child, guy, like, you know, guard, come forwards. I'm going to have the guard cut the child in half and I'll give half to each of you. And then in this story, because again, remember, it's not like a real story, it's a parable. In the story, what happens is the woman who just stole the child goes, yeah, do it, cut it in half. And so then obviously he knows that, well, that couldn't be the real mother, you know, because obviously the real mother would be the one who's like, no, no, in that case, just give it the child to her. Like, you know, mm. it's better that the child lives. That's like a clever way to do it. Mm. That's what I want the judge here to be like. I want the person who's the admin to be like, right, I'm not trying to ban people. If someone's done something wrong, I will ban them and I will ban them, you know, to the letter of the law. But if someone actually seems like they genuinely, it's an accident, they didn't, then I'm going to be merciful. Like, I'm going to actually find what's the reasonable. That's what you want the person to be like. You don't want the person to be like, is there any way I can, I can find that he said this thing? Mm. He did right ban him as much you don't want that person that's the last person who should be in that position there is there context to this is there context do the twitch people know this guy says idiot all the time on his stream he has never been racist he has never said the n-word like if this is someone that is all some maybe like this person very spicy and he's always sure. like towing the line and like all those contexts matter so much in this and like he's, of course he's never like that so it's actually something that happens in court, by the way, in court, they actually do instruct you. I don't know if they do it in America, but in England, something that they actually say to juries is if someone has never had a criminal record, even though that might have no context to the actual crime they might have mm -hmm. been accused of now, they will say, I actually would want to point out, like the judge will say, I want to point out this person has no criminal record. And so you should give him like the benefit of the doubt as yeah. a result that he doesn't have like a history of doing crime. Like you shouldn't assume he did it. So mm -hmm. I would say that, yeah, I agree with you. I think they should have, should look look that up. Like, like, for example, I would actually want to know, did the person who's making the judgment, do they even know who that is? If they don't, I might not be a good person to make the call. Mm -hmm. 
All right. <clears throat> cool. Um, Leafa, Dorian, any final topics you guys want to hit on? There's nothing in this call. We kind of went all over the place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we kind of went all over the place. Just want to hit on. Just leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> if you're ever in LA and you want some boba tea and some great company with an entirely harmless young man from Korea, Loco's always there. Leave, always we hang out all the time in LA whenever you're here. I bet you do. I bet you fucking do. Oh, uh, yeah. I was actually oh. in LA last week. I didn't call you. No, I'm joking. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> no, no, no. Of course, of course. Loco's great. Yeah. Just, yeah. I, I we're this not hanging out. This isn't a dating ad. This isn't a dating ad for oh, Loco, right? Is that what... Exactly. <laughs> we're, we're not hanging out next he, time. He doesn't want we're, we're to hang out next time. anymore. We're not hanging out. He's next looking time. for a yeah. deep connection and that now. So don't send him nudes. He's over that life. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> I hate you. I fucking hate you. Anyway, don't send him nudes. He likes that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Letha, any final words before we end the show? No, it's it was actually time flew by. Wow, I think. We kind of went all over the place. It's funny because we're like, let's talk about media, but we kind of went, you know, your dating life, talked about streamers. Like, it kind of really went all over the place, which was honestly really fun. I'm glad. I'm glad we did this. And hopefully we get to do it again next time. Maybe we'll have you guys on our show. For sure, this for sure. Kind of fun. For sure.